Jeez. As is the tradition of this assembly on budget day, with the consent of the House, we'll commence with the motion for the resolution number 1190, respecting the estimates under orders of the day. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. With your consent, I now recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to the notice of motion given by me on March 27, 2015, and the rules and forms of procedure of the House of Assembly, I have the honour by command to present a message from His Honour, the Lieutenant Governor of the Province of Nova Scotia, relating to the estimates of sums required for the service of the province for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2016, which is, quote, I hereby transmit estimates of sums I hereby transmit estimates of sums required for the public service of the province for the year ending March 31, 2016, and in accordance with the Constitution Act 1867, recommend them together with the budget address of my Minister of Finance and Treasury Board and any resolutions or bills necessary or advisable to approve the estimates and implement the budget measures to the House of Assembly. Signed, J.J. Grant, Lieutenant Governor, April 9, 2015. Mr. Speaker, at this time, I wish to, one, table the message from His Honour, the Lieutenant Governor of the province, transmitting the estimates for the consideration of this House, two, table the estimate books, three, table the government business plan, four, table the estimate and Crown Corporation business plan resolutions, and five, deliver my budget speech, and six, move that the estimates of sums required for the service of the province for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2016, being supplied to be granted to Her Majesty and the Crown Corporation's business plans be referred to the Committee of the Whole House on Supply. Down there, I think I give you all of that. Everything. Thank you. I don't need that. The reports are tabled. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And just before I begin my budget speech, I'd like to make a few introductions, if you would allow me. Permission granted. Mr. Speaker, I have a number of staff members that are in the gallery this afternoon. I think they're in the East Gallery. Um, yes, I have the Deputy Minister, George McClellan, and Lori Curry from Treasury Board, I think, is there. And uh, I'm not sure who else is there. But I'd like to, on, on behalf of the, of the House, thank, thank George and the team for all the hard work that goes into preparing these estimates. Now, Mr. Speaker, on, on a personal and more local level, I would like to introduce a couple of friends, and I would also like to introduce two students from Halifax West High School who have been viewing the process today of estimates and, and seeing what goes on in the, in the government and in the, in the lockups and so on with, with this process. So I'd like to introduce Ina Fair and Panos Giannopoulos, who are from Halifax West High School. Thank you very much for being here today. And finally, and I know you're being very indulgent, I'd like to introduce my very important guests, Stuart and Caroline Whalen, who are here with me, and my friends, John McCready and Kathy, Kathy Swenson and Norm Doucette. So maybe all of you would just rise and receive the warm welcome of the house. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know it's always an important day when we have family with us as well in the house. So let me begin, Mr. Speaker. Once again, it is an honor to stand before this assembly to update you on our financial progress and outline our plan for 2015-16. We are making significant progress in getting the government's fiscal house in order, yet there is still considerable work to be done. When we took office, government spending significantly exceeded revenue. When I rose in the House last year to deliver our first budget, we had anticipated a $279 million deficit in 2014-15. I'm pleased to report this year's deficit is now forecast at $102.1 million. Thank you. 
Furthermore, our, def our budget deficit for 1516 for the 15-16 year will be $97.6 million, and if our assumptions hold true, Mr. Speaker, we will be able to report a surplus in 2016-17. That's good. Mr. Speaker, this is primarily due to our determination to halt the increase in government spending. When wage increases are taken out of the equation, overall departmental spending has increased by only 0.2%. To my mind, this represents remarkable progress. Thank you. I want to thank all of my colleagues and staff for their hard work over the past 18 months. Our approach to fiscal discipline has been constant, and we have begun the process of refocusing our limited resources on the core responsibilities of government. As I announced earlier this week, members of this House are leading by example, and their salaries will be frozen for the next three years. Last year, when I addressed the House, our focus was on keeping our campaign commitments and laying the foundation for private sector growth. During the year, we have made significant progress on both. This budget reflects our, con our efforts to control spending and a very clear focus on priorities, to educate young Nova Scotians, to ensure better access to health care, to let the private sector drive job creation and economic growth, and to spend and invest prudently with a focus on long-term sustainability. On the spending side, we have examined in detail the many programs and services that are offered by government. Our aim has been to find ways to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our programs. We look for duplication or programs that are no longer meeting their objectives. Most importantly, we've been willing to challenge the status quo and keep the interests of Nova Scotians as our number one priority. Under the leadership of the Premier, we commenced an ongoing program review and asked ourselves these questions. One, do current programs and government activities still serve the public interest? Two, is there a legitimate and necessary role for government in these programs and activities? Three, is the current role of government appropriate, effective, and efficient? Four, if we continue the program or activity, can we make government more efficient and effective in its delivery? And finally, are the existing programs or activities affordable given our current fiscal situation? For too long, governments have turned away from the responsibility to evaluate and assess programs to ensure they are serving the public interest for fear of the political consequences of making tough decisions. During my budget address last year, I talked of the need to change the conversation. The One Nova Scotia report had struck an important chord across our province, and I found a public eager to contemplate new solutions. Our collective resolve to answer the call to action to halt the slide and to avoid a prolonged decline in the quality of our public services will continue and it will continue to be tested in the months and years ahead. In fact, I can say that I discovered something important about Nova Scotians. The general public is ahead of many institutions, including government, in its recognition that change is long overdue. The inflated wage pattern of the past several years has prevented a return to balance. The fact that our economic growth stalled in tandem with this wage pattern made the situation even more difficult. The generosity of two, two and a half, and three percent wage increases left a major burden for all Nova Scotians. As a result, over 900 million was added to government's labour costs over the last three years. It is somewhat, it is, it is important to remember that these costs are now embedded in the costs of government. Additionally, it is important it is also important to note that approximately $52.5 billion of the province's total budget of $8.9 billion for departmental spending goes towards wages and benefits. That is 58% of all of our departmental spending. However, I'm pleased with the fact that we have made real progress and we have met many of the challenges that arose. Of course, stronger economic growth and fiscal sus sustainability are top priorities for our government. But a balanced budget is not an end unto itself. Instead, fiscal discipline is a means towards maintenance of core public services, the services that Nova Scotians need to improve the quality of their lives. Our motivation is the improvement of public services in health, public infrastructure, 
support for our most vulnerable citizens, and an education system that prepares Nova Scotians to prosper in a changing world. Thank you. This is why, this is why we must continue on the path we are on. Sustaining top quality education and investing in early childhood development are core functions of government. Investing in education is the long game. Our most strategic investment is in people. It is. Yeah. As the world continues to rapidly evolve, we have, to direct we have a direct responsibility to help Nova Scotians excel in a knowledge-based economy. And that means taking a lifelong approach to education. Our government is very focused on investing in early childhood education and in the P-12 system. That approach also extends to post-secondary support, apprenticeships, training, and workforce attachment. In our first budget, we embarked upon our commitment to rebuild our education system after $65 million was cut by the previous administration. But it is more than just money itself. We've also begun a program to dramatically improve the education system. We completed the first education review in a quarter century. That review is now prompting action, and the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development is responding to the recommendations in the report. And work is well underway, Mr. Speaker. This year, the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development will invest an additional $20.4 million in this vitally important sector. This is in addition to the $17.3 million that was invested last year in education. This will include continued investment on class caps for grades primary to two. Additionally, grades three and four will be capped to ensure our children get the best possible start in life and that our teachers can take the time they need to teach. We know our students have fallen behind in math and literacy, nationally and internationally. This year, we will continue to tackle that problem by investing a further $3 million in a provincial math strategy. <laughs> this renewed focus will provide more time for teaching math in the early years, ensuring we get the fundamentals right. We will also invest $2.4 million in language arts for grades primary to three. Research clearly indicates that the early years of a child's life set the stage for their success. In order to help our children get the best possible start in life, we will invest an additional $1.3 million in early intervention programs and $700,000 in early learning initiatives. There will also be $1.1 million to fund school mental health clinicians. With this budget, we are continuing new investment in education by increasing provincial funding to post-secondary education by $3.2 million in each of the next four years. With this investment, we are also introducing legislation to ensure accountability for the tax dollars they receive. We are working closely with the presidents from all 10 Nova Scotia universities to ensure their direction is better aligned with the social and economic goals of our province. At the same time, we're ensuring that participation and access to post-secondary education continues to be affordable for Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, to support students who decide to pursue post-secondary education, we have changed the debt cap program to the Nova Scotia Loan Forgiveness Program. Nova Scotia undergraduate students who graduate within a reasonable time will be able to have their entire provincial loan forgiven. This could save students up to $15,000 of the cost of their university degree. <laughs> Program changes will also help students with permanent disabilities. Currently, students need to complete their studies within four years to qualify for maximum assistance under the old debt cap program. Now, under the new Nova Scotia Loan Forgiveness Program, students with permanent disabilities will have 10 years to complete their degree and receive maximum debt forgiveness. The loan, the loan Forgiveness Program is for all Nova Scotia students attending Nova Scotia universities. 
Students who choose universities out of province will only be eligible if they can show that the program is not available in Nova Scotia. We have also removed interest costs from the provincial portion of student loans, which has further reduced the cost for many to attend our post-secondary institutions. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, last year we announced the Graduate Opportunities Program that supports young college and university graduates to get started in their chosen field. This will mark the first full year of the Graduate Opportunities Program. The program provides salary contributions to employers to offset the cost of hiring recent a recent graduate and to assist post-secondary graduates to find career opportunities here in Nova Scotia. In the year ahead, we will contribute $1.6 million to fulfilling our commitment to this program. <laughs> to further support lifelong learning, we will invest in one, Brilliant Labs, a $400,000 investment in all eight school boards to help teachers incorporate technology, creativity, and entrepreneurship in the classroom. <laughs> Two, innovation, incubation, acceleration of entrepreneurs and startups through innovation centers in Sydney, Truro, Liverpool, Parsboro, Halifax, and Dartmouth. Key sectors will include agriculture and agri-food, seafood, ocean technology, tidal energy, forestry, and information and communication technology. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we will also be investing in improved apprenticeship programming through the newly created Nova Scotia Apprenticeship Agency. Future investment in young Nova Scotians will be made possible by maintaining our current financial discipline. Mr. Speaker, it's been said that the best fiscal plan is a strong economy. In fact, the root cause of our fiscal challenge is that in the past year, that, that in the past years, government spending growth has greatly surpassed our economic growth. And previous governments did not face up to this. At the beginning of 2014, Nova Scotia had the dubious distinction of having the worst performing economy in Canada measured by real GDP growth for the last 20 years. In February 2014, the One Nova Scotia Commission offered a stark assessment of our current reality. After two decades of slow economic growth, our province hovered on the verge of significant prolonged decline in our standard of living, our population, and in the quality of our public services. Since then, some indicators have been more promising for Nova Scotia, suggesting our economy is slowly improving. For example, Nova Scotia led the provinces in goods export growth in 2014. <laughs> there were substantial gains in natural gas output and non-energy exports such as seafood, forest products and manufactured goods. Forecasters project better GDP growth for Nova Scotia in the next two years. Despite this, there are concerns for the longer term economic growth. Our offshore is a unique growth opportunity for our province. We remain committed to our offshore growth plan by investing in marketing and geoscience programs to encourage additional exploration activity off our coast in a safe and sustainable manner. Already the plan is dem demonstrating success. D despite the decline in world oil prices, Shell and its partners Suncor and ConocoPhillips remain committed to a $1 billion exploration program that will see the first well drilled this year yeah. Mr. Speaker, further to that, BP and its partners Hess and Woodside also committed to another $1 billion program that saw one of the largest seismic data collection programs in the world last year. <laughs> Major project investments in the near term include the Maritime Link, the Shipbuilding Project, the McDonald Bridge Redecking, and the Halifax Convention Centre. The Donkin Mine and liquefied natural gas export opportunities are all further reasons for optimism. In addition, we're enabling the development of a world-class tidal energy sector. With the highest tides in the world in the Bay of Fundy, we have a unique competitive advantage. But we have an obligation to do better. The solutions of the past have not worked, so government needs a new approach to private sector and social enterprise growth. 
As I said 14 months ago, Nova Scotians received the report of the Nova Scotia Commission on Building Our New Economy. The report called for changes in attitudes, policies, and practices across government and, and in community sectors. The report said, quote, we believe there is significant value in reorganizing business-related programming within a new department, with a new minister, and a crystal clear mandate to support all aspects of business expansion in Nova Scotia. We believe this clarity should extend to the actual title, the Minister of Business, unquote. I am pleased to report government is implementing that recommendation today. I would, I would also like to congratulate my colleague, the Honourable Mark Fury, the first Minister of the new Business of, Department of Business. Thank you. Under Minister Fury's leadership, the department will provide stronger direction, align government policies and programs more effectively, and be more efficient and focused on supporting business growth and innovation. This also reflects a long-standing request by the business community. The Department of Business will lead a portfolio of government departments and agencies that enable rural and urban business growth. The role of the Department of Business will be to focus on creating the most positive business environment to strategically promote business growth at all levels and regions in Nova Scotia. This will be extremely beneficial for innovation and growth in our rural economy, as the responsible use and development of our natural resources, together with tourism, are among our best opportunities for renewed prosperity in rural Nova Scotia. In, cre in creating the new Department of Business and eliminating the former Department of Economic and R Rural Development and Tourism, Government will achieve $29 million in savings in 2015-16 and ongoing savings in subsequent years of greater than $40 million a year. Yeah. During our first year in office, Government created Invest Nova Scotia. This organization is led by the private sector. It will support the work of the Department of Business by bringing additional expertise to decision-making about sector development and investment of public funds in a transparent and accountable way. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, I want to reiterate government's decision to have a private sector board lead our tourism sector. This new body will rely on sector expertise to guide this vitally important industry. The creation of a new Department of Business is continuing our government's commitment to following a new economic development strategy, one that is distinctly different from previous governments. From now on, Mr. Speaker, government will focus on helping to create the right business climate instead of picking winners and losers. Government and business play different but, but interrelated roles in creating a competitive, productive economy. Mr. Speaker, we know our role. A recent example of this is the Premier's work to facilitate the creation of a private sector-led equity fund of $50 million by Victor Chu. No public funds were required, and this decision represents a private sector vote of confidence in our province. Yeah. Taken together, Mr. Speaker, these initiatives allow business leaders to play a much larger role. Another key initiative of our government is the recently announced Office of Regulatory and Service Effectiveness. This office will be housed in the Department of Business and will be led by a Chief Regulatory Officer. In November 2014, my office received the Nova Scotia Tax and Regulatory Review Report, which I commissioned in February of last year. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to report that our new Office of Regulatory and Service Effectiveness is mandated to develop a regulatory reform agenda directed at implementing each and every recommendation that Laurel Broughton made relating to regulatory reform. A key focus of this office will also be the recently announced joint initiative with New Brunswick to streamline the regulatory environment between our two provinces. Government will also consolidate the inspection, compliance and enforcement functions of the Departments of Natural Resources, Agriculture, Fisheries and Aquaculture, Environment and the Public Health Inspectors from Health and Wellness into a new division within the Department of Environment. 
This change will unify inspection and enforcement activities and allow resource departments to focus on sector growth rather than policing activities. <laughs> this change takes effect July 1, 2015. In addition, this fall we intend to rationalize our non-resource land holdings by creating a flexible new entity with a mandate to sell surplus land and return it to productive private sector use, keep land that could support sector development and innovation or incubation sites, and manage land that is contaminated or has environmental issues or challenges. This new entity will work closely with the private sector. Mr. Speaker, we have listened. We have carefully planned and we are embarking on a new era that redefines government's appropriate role in creating a competitive and productive business environment. In doing so, we have streamlined government and will achieve better outcomes. Mr. Speaker, the work of government must always be focused on improving the lives of Nova Scotians. Our goals are, are improved health and wellness, enhanced community and social well-being, and population growth. Given our demographic trends, we'll also continue to invest in aging well and enhancing workplace opportunities for youth and for older workers. We will also support population growth by focusing on three goals, retaining our youth, encouraging Nova Scotians to come home, and attracting other Canadians and immigrants from around the world. The link between population growth and economic growth is clear. A strong economy is not only a good fiscal plan, it's also the best population growth plan. <laughs> For the first time in many years, we had modest population growth in our province in 2014. In areas such as immigration, we're making real headway. More immigrants chose to make Nova Scotia their home last year than at any time in the last 10 years. In addition, Mr. Speaker, more immigrants are also choosing to stay. The most recent Statistics Canada figures indicate a 71% retention rate for immigrants who arrived in Nova Scotia between 2007 and 2011. That's the highest rate in recent history. In our first 18 months in office, government has made a number of changes and launched initiatives to bring more immigrants to our province. Last summer, the Premier appointed Wadia Ferris and Colin Dodds as joint chairs of the Premier's Immigration Advisory Council. We, cha we changed the provincial nominee program to ensure that international students who want to stay in Nova Scotia have a way to do so. The Nova Scotia Demand Express Entry Stream was launched, providing a faster route for skilled and educated immigrants in response to labour market demands. And we have strengthened the partnership between government and se settlement service providers to enhance services for people, families, and communities. In 2015, we achieved a 50% increase in provincial nominees over last year, bringing the total to 1,050, up from 700 the previous year. We are continuing to work hard. This year, we will continue to focus on attracting new immigrants to Nova Scotia and ensure that they are supported to make this province their permanent home. We look forward to introducing a new business immigration stream that will attract immigrant entrepreneurs with strong business skills. We need their talent and their enthusiasm to grow our economy and our communities. Immigrants contribute economically and culturally to our province. My riding of Clayton Park West, Mr. Speaker, is one of the most culturally diverse in the province, and I see firsthand the benefits of opening our doors to newcomers. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in relation to all Nova Scotians, we have a responsibility to provide excellent health services. As I stated earlier, controlling our spending and encouraging economic growth enables us to have the capacity to invest in those core services. Of these, health care is far and away the most expensive and continues to account for the most significant amount of our overall provincial budget. 
On April 1, the Nova Scotia Health Authority became a reality. Its mandate is to deliver health care efficiently and effectively while remaining focused on the patient and frontline care. This patient-first approach will ensure consistent, high-quality health care across the province. <laughs> yeah. Bringing our resources together under a unified structure with strong leader leadership will ensure we can focus more money on health services and less on administration. By planning provincially and looking at innovative approaches, we expect better health outcomes for Nova Scotia in the future. This year, we will invest in areas that are important to Nova Scotians. $2 million to reduce, reduce orthopedic wait times for knee and hip replacements and other surgeries. $3.8 million to increase home care supports. $1.5 million in Senior Citizens Assistance Program to help seniors stay well and in their homes longer. One million to expand services for early intensive behavioral intervention for preschoolers with autism. <laughs> and 700,000 to expand the sexual assault nurse examiner program. <laughs> the agreement we've made with healthcare unions will streamline the number of bargaining units significantly in that sector from 50 to four. Coupled with the Essential Services Act passed in 2014, these initiatives have allowed Nova Scotians to have greater confidence in their access to health care. These changes, Mr. Speaker, will allow, allow our focus to be sharp and unwavering on the patient. During my travels, I heard it repeatedly. The people of this province feel a duty to support those who are most in need. It is one of our province's strengths and one of the reasons that I am proud to be Nova Scotian. Work has already begun to transform our programs to focus directly on supporting our most vulnerable through benefit reforms that will help improve their lives. Our focus this year will be on continuing to transform services for persons with disabilities. This year we will take the first step towards stable, multi-year funding for disability support program providers. We will change the way we fund these providers to ensure more equitable distribution of funding and improved accountability, all to better serve Nova Scotians who depend on these services. We will also invest an additional $2.5 million in direct family support programming. Work on income assistance benefit reform will continue this year as we focus on the benefits we provide and, as importantly, on how we provide them. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that later this month, Nova Scotia's first sexual violence prevention strategy will be released. We, we will invest $2 million in prevention, in education, and, in, and to support survivors of, survivors of abuse. Government is also looking at the feasibility of implementing social impact bonds in Nova Scotia. Social finance has the potential to create opportunities for both investors and community organizations. This may be a way to provide access to new sources of funds for projects that will benefit our society. Due to the success of the program, we will also be extending the Domestic Violence Court in Cape Breton with an additional $430,000 commitment. In the year ahead, government will continue to focus efforts to support those in need. We will, remain, we will maintain the affordable living tax credit that provides $65.8 million to over 200,000 low-income Nova Scotians, and we will protect income assistance rates. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, when we speak of the importance of fiscal discipline, it is precisely because we need the capacity to do more for those who most need our help. With this context and the information I provided on where we are investing in a better future, in education, the economy and our people, I would like to focus now on our fiscal plan for 2015-16. We have essentially held the line on spending. In fact, total government spending has increased by only 0.7% in our fiscal plan. Mm -hmm. 
We are poised to turn the corner on total debt if we can sustain our fiscal plan. Every dollar reduction we make with regards to debt service is a dollar avail available for new programs that can help us transition our people and our economy. While this is a significant accomplishment, it has to be recognized that government's expenses still exceed our revenues. The key categories of the current budget are total revenues are expected to be $9.92 billion. Total spending is estimated at $10 billion. Interest payments on public debt will be $872 million, or 8.7% of the expense budget. Health expenditures will be $4.1 billion, or 46.4% of total departmental spending. And education expenditures will be $1.2 billion, or 14%. When I commenced my remarks, I described our program review process and the five questions that we ask ourselves as we pursue ongoing program review. After checking if public objectives are being achieved, the last question we ask with respect to each program is, is it affordable and is it providing the best value for all Nova Scotians? A recommendation from the tax review involved the film industry tax credit and the need for modification. The report said our film industry tax credit is considered to be one of the most generous in the country. We have heard from many people who work in the film industry. Some clearly are here in Nova Scotia and contributing in many ways to our province. Our challenge has been to find a new structure that will offer support to the industry and at the same time increase accountability and benefit to our provincial economy. Nova Scotians want their tax dollars to support Nova Scotia. I want to be very clear today, the film industry tax credit remains. I also want to be clear on another point. We cannot look at this tax credit in isolation. We need to consider it with all other tools that government uses to stimulate the economy and help industries, not just the film industry. There is only one taxpayer and only one pot of money we need to maximize return on this and every investment. In order to rebalance this credit, we will change it from one that is fully refundable to one that is 25% refundable. The remaining 75% of the eligible tax credit will be provided as a non-refundable credit. In other words, Mr. Speaker, 75% is available to film companies against the taxes that they owe in Nova Scotia. These changes will take effect July 1, 2015. This timing will ensure that projects that are currently in progress can continue and also provide the industry time to transition. We have budgeted $24 million this fiscal year to ensure that there is no interruption to the credit. The film industry relies heavily on this subsidy. I recognize this change will be deeply felt and many will react negatively. We simply cannot afford to maintain the credit in its current form. In addition to the tax credit, we are establishing a creative economy fund. This $6 million fund will be designed in consultation and collaboration with the industry and will be open to creative industries, including publishing, animation, music, sound recording, and film. To ensure creative industries are best positioned to realize their potential, we will also move responsibility for this sector to Nova Scotia Business Inc. Aligning the creative sector with NSBI is a vote of confidence in the industry, which will now be better positioned to take advantage of supports that will help it focus on international exports, expansion, and growth. I have referred a number of times to charting a path for growth, the report of the Nova Scotia Tax and Regulatory Review. Since receiving the report in November, I have personally been consulting with Nova Scotians from all walks of life. I've listened to social justice advocates, business leaders, students, and many others. Nearly 500 people attended our sessions, and we, we received more than 300 emails and letters. Many participants in the session spoke about the need to address our demographic challenges. 
Others spoke of protecting programs and services that most, that, most, that most serve our vulnerable Nova Scotians. Still others spoke of the need to change, to change and the urgency around it. The tax and regulatory report challenges us all to look at our tax system differently. It's a conversation we all need to have. I want to be very clear today, we are taking a long view. Some of the measures that are recommended need more careful analysis. We need to understand their impacts on people and we need to consult further in some cases. A systematic and structural plan that rolls out over a number of years is necessary. That being said, in this, our first budget since receiving the release of the report, we're making the following decisions. The film industry tax credit is being modified, as I have explained. We have made the decision to maintain the volunteer firefighter tax credit for the people who stand ready to help Nova Scotians in a time of need. And likewise, Mr. Speaker, the $10 million provincial tax exemption on printed books will be maintained to support publishers, authors, and booksellers, and also to support students and public libraries. In addition to these decisions, we will move forward on several other tax changes. We will rebalance taxes paid on income earned through wages or dividends by lowering the non-eligible dividend tax credit. Over the past few years, the dividend tax credit has not kept pace with changing conditions. To ensure the system is equitable, the rate is being reduced from 5.87% to 3.5%. This change will restore $30 million in revenue for the province. Mr. Speaker, we will also increase tobacco taxes by two cents per cigarette because evidence suggests increased pricing results in lower consumption. Our plan for the year ahead includes the establishment of a tax working group to act as a sounding board on implementation challenges and opportunities with regard to the tax recommendations, consideration of our existing credits and exemptions to ensure best value, and ongoing consultation and conversations with Nova Scotians about key recommendations in the report. As part of the 2015-16 budget, I have also tabled our four-year fiscal plan. This plan outlines our projected revenue and expenses. To reiterate, I'm proud of the fact that government has outlined a plan that will see our province in a surplus position next year, a full year ahead of earlier expectations. The net debt to GDP ratio is regarded as the most comprehensive indicator of the province's financial position. It hit a, a, a recent peak of 37.7% at the end of 2014. This ratio is expected to improve over the fiscal plan, reaching 33.4% by 2018-19, bringing us closer to the goals set in the One Nova Scotia report. However, <laughs> however, to achieve the plan, we must continue control, to control spending and examine the effectiveness of our programs and services, and perhaps most importantly, set the conditions to grow the economy. Our guiding principle will continue to be fiscal sustainability, so we remain able to invest in core public services that enable Nova Scotians to improve the quality of their lives. Mr. Speaker, this budget takes a major step towards a modern, flexible, sustainable government. In the year ahead, our work will continue to be guided by the responsible stewardship of Nova Scotia's finances. To date, our concentration has been on our core responsibilities, ensuring a high-quality health care system that is able to modernize and improve access to Nova Scotians rebuilding our education system in a way that offers all Nova Scotians the skills they need to excel in a changing world, and taking further steps to create the conditions required to allow the private sector to, to create meaningful employment opportunities for Nova Scotians. We have met these core responsibilities while keeping spending at historically low levels, and we have headed towards a surplus position. Again, this fiscal discipline will provide us with options to address the things that matter most to Nova Scotians. I believe we all share common values. We want better access to health care. 
We want an education system that allows young Nova Scotians and their families to excel and thrive. And we want a vibrant private sector that maximizes our advantages and creates jobs across the province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in my role as finance minister, I'm responsible for considering the many competing demands that are placed on government. I have said we cannot afford to be all things to all people. Our small province needs to be sure that every dollar spent is getting the best return for our taxpayers. That is the hard reality of planning a budget and examining all the important services that we are asked to fund. Before I conclude, I want to thank all of my colleagues and most especially the public servants who have contributed so much to the development of this budget and to the ongoing high quality services that they provide to Nova Scotians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, can you indulge me on a point of order, please, or a couple of points of order? Uh, number one is the accessibility of our public gallery. This is the People's House, and yet for a while, probably through three quarters of the Minister's speech, there was two people sitting in the West Gallery. So I was wondering if you could have a quick look at why people were restricted into joining us to listen to this important speech that they're finding whether uh, they're being affected or not by the minister's uh, budget. There was, uh, by the look of it, no access by the amount of people that were sitting downstairs and by the number of people that were here in uh, the public gallery. So I was wondering if you could review that. Uh, secondly, by the way, minister, there's a little piece missing between pages uh, 15 and, and 16. So there's a paragraph you read that's not in our documents. And, and secondly, um, we all know, we've been here for a long time that we do not refer to other colleagues in the House by their names. So I'm just wondering if we could remember that too. But really, really, where is the public gallery? Where, why don't we have a public gallery that is accessible to Nova Scotians? I'll take that point of order under advisement and I'll come back to the House uh, tomorrow with uh, some information. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I too rise on a point but a, a point of personal privilege, Mr. Go. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I think that every member of this House comes here not in their individual capacity, but in their capacity to represent their constituencies and represent the people of the province. And in the time that I've been here, I have never yeah. seen the media excluded from the chamber outside this house to conduct their work, particularly or from the gallery, particularly during a very important day here in our province, the delivery of the budget. And I feel as a member that the refusal to have people who communicate to the public the work of this chamber, what the government members are doing, what the opposition members are doing, is a violation of our privilege as members of this assembly. And I would ask you as speaker to look into how did this occur and, and communicate back to us how it occurred with some consultation so we can make sure that this does not happen again, Mr. Speaker. I'll take that under advisement and report back tomorrow. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear, Mr. Speaker. You actually control this chamber, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. You know the capacity of what happens in the Speaker. Never before, Mr. Speaker, in the history of this House has a sitting government sat here, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. The Honourable Premier has the floor. Before, Mr. Speaker, in the history of any political party, has our staff been removed out of this gallery, Mr. Speaker, to allow? So to allow these two members to stand up, Mr. Speaker, and suggest that it was government who controls who's in the gallery of this house is, Mr. Speaker, is misleading and unreasonable. Order, please.
The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I begin, may I have uh, permission to make an introduction? Permission granted. Thank you. Uh, seated in the West Gallery today, I have my good friend uh, Norman Lord and his son uh, Curtis Lord, and I'm happy to have them here today. Maybe they can stand up and receive the warm welcome of the House. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to, uh, to rise today and give a reply to the uh, to the minister's budget and first off I do want to I do want to thank the minister for uh, for the preparation of the budget I, I can only imagine the incredible amount of work that goes into uh, preparing these documents so I do thank her for that work and uh, with her indulgence I would also thank uh, thank uh, the host of staff that work on these documents uh, I'm sure through a number of iterations and changes and drafts and including sitting with us in the lockup and answering our questions so uh, I would say to them, uh, where we, whether we may disagree on political points in this thing, it's certainly not a reflection of their work. So I certainly agree. I uh, want to thank the staff for their work. I will say, uh, Mr. Speaker, that I came in today with a certain degree of apprehension and uh, some optimism that all of the tough talk we heard leading up to today would have, some, would have some positive results. Now, I come from a, a part of the province, a part of Nova Scotia, that desperately needs some good news, uh, needs some jobs. And uh, so as I read these budget documents, I was asking myself, who is positively impacted by this budget? Who will this budget help? And that's, that's the lens that I was looking at this budget document through. So after listening to the, the talk leading up to today and uh, sitting down this morning and starting to read, read these documents, I will say that when I went through the, uh, the, the glossy highlights and the, and the budget address, I looked at all the, the shiny documents and the summary numbers and I have to say, I was, uh, I was encouraged. Uh, at first blush, when I looked at this document, I was more encouraged today than I was yesterday. And, uh, and that's a good thing. But Mr. Speaker, in doing our job and uh, digging through the details, uh, the details of the budget, it became apparent to me that there are many, many really good things that have to happen for these budget estimates to become a reality. And I have to say that uh, looking at some of the uh, projections and some of the assumptions, you know, time will tell if this budget becomes reality. And uh, in saying that, I look at last year's numbers. And last year, when the budget was tabled, we saw a deficit of $278 million. So today, I picked up the, the glossy brochure, and I saw that this number is now $102 million. And I thought to myself, wow, that's incredible progress. But Mr. Speaker, then you dig into the details and you see that that includes a $107 million windfall, one-time adjustment from Ottawa, and another $50 million um, surprise good guy, to use an accounting technical term, uh, that also came from the federal government for corporate taxes. And you start to ask yourself, you start to ask yourself, what did our government do to improve last year's $278 million budget estimate to get it to 102? And the fact of the matter is, is that without the 107 and without the 50, the deficit would have been 259. Now, granted, that's versus 278, 
So this government shaved off 22 million. And I make that point only to stress that we need to, we need to make sure that we understand what makes up the numbers we're looking at. 278 million down to 102 looks very impressive. 278 million, 278 million to 259, not so much, not so much. So over the next few days and weeks, we will be looking at this year's uh, budget estimate of $97 million deficit through that lens. And we'll have many, many, much time and much discussion over what makes up that 97, Mr. Speaker. But I will say that uh, with, with just a little over three hours this morning to review the budget and its supporting documents, I don't know, maybe 400 pages worth of material, there were immediately things that make us curious. We saw what happened with last year, and now we look at the things this year. And, and on the revenue side, the revenue for this year is forecast uh, to increase. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to tell you that going around my constituency and speaking to Nova Scotians, I don't actually know a lot of Nova Scotians that are bubbling with optimism that they will make more money this year and therefore pay more taxes and therefore spend more money to generate more HST income. I don't know where those Nova Scotians are, so when I look at the revenue increases, the estimates going up, I ask myself, where will it come from? What Nova Scotians are going to pay more in uh, personal income tax? And yet we see a $157 million increase in expected revenue. So I ask myself, why? Is it because of steps this government has taken to grow the economy? We do see innovation centers, and I do think that is a, a positive thing. I will say that uh, that's a positive thing. I'm encouraged by that. I'm interested to see how that plays out. But on the other hand, we see in the address where the government says the best opportunities for renewed prosperity in rural Nova Scotia will come from the development of our natural resources. And I, I absolutely believe that's a true statement, but I look at this budget and I ask myself, how will that happen? And I'm open-minded, and I want to believe because rural Nova Scotia certainly needs, needs leadership and it needs prosperity. But I ask myself, will that come from the creation of a new department? We look at what's happened in rural Nova Scotia over the last year and in many ways we've seen rural Nova Scotia held back. And in coming into today, I was optimistic that we would see something on aquaculture. We would see something to help lobster fishermen we would see something to help the small mills around Nova Scotia that are closing and the hardwood companies that are closing and the flooring companies. I was hopeful that we would see something to, see, to, hope, to help those people. And hopefully, we will see it. Hopefully, we will see movement on that. But today, I wonder how creating a new department will help those rural Nova Scotia economies. And we look at the 97 million deficit and we ask, how does that number come about? We focus on the revenues and I see, I see a $30 million increase in tax revenue coming from a dividend tax credit change. $30 million, Mr. Speaker. Dividend tax credit change. That sounds very fancy to me non-eligible, it's a change to the non-eligible dividend tax credit. And Mr. Speaker, I can get all the explanations I need, but the only question I have is, 
The only question I have is, who's going to pay the $30 million? The answer, Mr. Speaker, small business owners. Small business owners will pay that $30 million. That's exactly where it'll come from. Now, putting more taxes on top of small business owners under a fancy name is still more taxes on small business owners. And we'll see how that helps us grow our economy. We have another $30 million, Mr. Speaker, in tax revenue. That's going to come from all of us. Nova Scotians will pay $30 million more in taxes just due to bracket creep. That's money that will come right out of the pockets of Nova Scotians. So I ask myself, I ask myself, where is the real plan for sustainable growth? Where is the plan for revenue? Now, we see, we see that, yes, um, I take the, the minister's point that a film tax credit uh, will remain. But it's changed, Mr. Speaker. And the film tax credit change will generate money for the government. But what will it do to industry? And that's the question. What will it do to our, our industry here with that tax credit change? And there's, there's, there's no answer to that question today, Mr. Speaker. The minister uh, did say in, in her briefing that the, the restructured tax credit keeps us in the game. It keeps us in the game. Well, it may keep us in the game uh, plain shorthanded, Mr. Speaker. We'll have to see how that plays out because industry is the one that will decide whether or not we're in the game. When I look at the departmental expenses, Mr. Speaker, I see that departmental expenses are up by $127 million over forecast. And we've made the point many times, Mr. Speaker, if the government would simply hold the line on spending, we'd have a surplus. We said it last year, we've said it over the past year, we'll say it again today, because uh, uh, departmental spending is up, and it's up by $127 million, and if it wasn't up, we would have a, uh, uh, a surplus today, Mr. Speaker. So, going... Um, in terms of expenses and managing expenses, the only way to really manage is expenses is if you understand them. And one of the things that I would like to see, uh, Mr. Speaker, from the government going forward is I would like to see the government really try to understand the cost of the services that it provides. And I say that, Mr. Speaker, in, speak in thinking about uh, health care which is a major expense of the government. And uh, yet we don't know the cost of ind individual procedures. And maybe if that's something we knew, um, it could help us control our costs better. You need information to make good, in good decisions. And this is the type of information that we should, be, we should be trying to make sure the government has. So over time, I'd like to see, I'd like to see that uh, as a goal of the government. But I will say, uh, Mr. Speaker, that there are, there are some uh, very good initiatives in here. Uh, initiatives around education and young people, uh, around uh, orthopedic wait times, early intervention, um, home support. Those are all things that every MLA in here, every Nova Scotian knows are important. And we need to work towards those. And I do see some good initiatives in here around those things. And that's a good thing. But the question becomes, how do, we, how do we manage these programs? And the, how does the government fund these programs? And I am worried, Mr. Speaker, I'm worried that the plan is to continue to depend on increasing tax revenue to fund government rather than finding sustainable ways to create jobs and promote uh, private sector revenue. We can't just keep finding new ways, new fees, new taxes uh, to fund the government. We need to have a province that's welcoming and lets the economy grow.
as I look through this document over the next few days and through the estimates, that's what I'm going to be looking for. Didn't jump off the page at me today, Mr. Speaker, I have to say. And if we look to the next couple of years, um, we look at next year. Surplus, surplus projected next year, Mr. Speaker, on the back of three, $300 million increase in tax revenue, the government's projecting uh, a, a surplus of $22 million. And if we look out one year past that, Mr. Speaker, another $200 million in tax revenue on top of that to generate a surplus of $25 million. So over the next couple of years, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians can look forward uh, to paying $500 million more in taxes. $500 million more for a surplus of $50 million. And uh, over the next few days and weeks, we will be analyzing those numbers and trying to understand that because uh, that's where we need to, we need to understand, Mr. Speaker, that doesn't sound like great value for money. So, um, so we, need to, uh, we need to work to really understand the plan for the province. And um, with all the uh, good initiatives that I, that I acknowledge to be in here today, there's one line in the, in the minister's address that kind of gave me pause for thought. And the line says, some of the measures that are recommended need more careful analysis. Makes me wonder, Mr. Speaker, which ones of these might, might, uh, might fall off the table after that careful analysis or how they end up in this, in this document being heralded today uh, when that's still out there. So these, these are all questions we have. Uh, we need to find a way that government can, can be, uh, get out of the way of business. Yes, we do, let businesses grow. And, uh, but more so than that, government needs to have its own plan on how it will fund itself. And hopefully that plan uh, extends past just finding uh, more fees for Nova Scotians to pay. It extends past just finding more ways to tax Nova Scotians. And uh, that is what we'll be looking for, Mr. Speaker, over the next few days. So uh, with, those, with those few words, I would move that we adjourn the debate on the budget process for today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Motion. <clears throat> the motion is to adjourn debate on the budget for today. Is it agreed? It is agreed. We'll pick it up tomorrow. We'll now begin with the remainder of the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. Presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. Statements by ministers. Government notices a motion. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here I give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas today marks the 98th <coughs> anniversary of the start of the Battle of Vimy Ridge, a battle which is widely considered a turning point in Canadian military history, and whereas more than 10,000 Canadian soldiers were wounded and killed in the battle, and whereas the 85th and the 106th Battalions from Nova Scotia played key roles in this battle, Mr. Speaker, which was one of the most significant victories over German forces and a battle that is regarded as the coming of age for Canada as a nation. Therefore, be it resolved that this House remembers the brave sacrifices made at Vimy Ridge, and we pay tribute to those who serve our country in the defence of freedom. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage of the debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. We'll now move on to introduction of bills. Notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Mr. Speaker. 98 years ago today, four Canadian Corps divisions set out to capture Vimy Ridge. The battle raged until April 12, 1917, when the Canadian Army captured the ridge in what is Canada's most celebrated military victory. That victory quickly became a symbol 
and has been described as the birth of our nation because for the first time soldiers from every region in Canada fought together as a single force. It sparked a sense of national pride and confidence <coughs> that endures to this day. The victory at Vimy Ridge came at a terrible cost, however, with more than 10,000 Canadians killed or wounded. Today, let us remember the sacrifice and bravery of those Canadians who fought at Vimy Ridge and give thanks to the many freedoms the victory brought our young country. Thank you. Barring no more <clears throat> member statements, we'll now move on to orders of the day with oral questions put by members to ministers. Time is now 2.17. We'll conclude at 3.07. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, what a missed opportunity today is for people in Nova Scotia who had been told to expect real change to the way their government operates and have been let down today. In a province that relies on small businesses to create jobs and employ Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, the government is once again relying on tax increases and projections of greater tax revenue to address its fiscal challenges instead of making the real reforms that Nova Scotians have been told to brace for. Mr. Speaker, for our small businesses, today they face a $30 million increase in their taxes as the tax credit for them is being greatly reduced. I will ask the Premier, why did he decide to raise the taxes on small business by $30 million today instead of make the major changes that he told Nova Scotians <coughs> were coming? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have not raised uh, the tax on small business, uh, Mr. Speaker. As a matter of fact, we have not raised the taxes, Mr. Speaker, on Nova Scotians or small businesses. What has changed, Mr. Speaker, is those Nova Scotians who have incorporated themselves so that they can get around the tax system, Mr. Speaker, so they can pay themselves through dividends to, re to reduce their ability to pay tax. We've closed that gap like every other province has, Mr. Speaker. When the small business tax lowers, so is that tax credit, Mr. Speaker. So lawyers who found a way around it, Mr. Speaker, today are being asked to contribute. Mr. Speaker, chartered accountants, those who know how to figure it out, Mr. Speaker, we're asking them to contribute. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the fact is the previous NDP government closed that gap when they reduced the threshold on small business in the budget a few years ago, something that the Premier then opposed. Now, whatever way you want to put it, the small business of Nova Scotia will pay $30 million more in the upcoming year than they paid last year. And they are not the only ones. In a province where everyday working Nova Scotia families are already tapped out, paying the highest income taxes in the country, Mr. Speaker, they face a hidden tax increase through bracket creep of $30 million more today, Mr. Speaker. Nova Scotians were told to brace for real reform. I'll ask the Premier, why did he decide to dig $30 million deeper into the pockets of everyday Nova Scotia working families instead of make the changes that he told Nova Scotians were coming? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, the leader of the Conservative Court party couldn't be further wrong in all of his assumptions here, Mr. Speaker. We, it's becoming commonplace in this house. The fact of the matter is the small business rate has not changed in this province, Mr. Speaker. If you were a small business owner in this province, the tax you were paying yesterday, you were paying today, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is we've closed a loophole around the fact, Mr. Speaker, that there are people who have incorporated themselves to get around paying their fair share of taxes. Why does the leader of the Conservative Party believe that a small business in rural Nova Scotia employing four or five people should be treated differently than a lawyer in downtown Halifax who's figured out how to get around the tax system by incorporating himself and paying themselves through dividends? Tell us why. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the only thing that's becoming commonplace in this House is a Premier that doesn't answer the questions, because my question was about the income taxes paid by Nova Scotia families and the hidden increase in their personal taxes. Of course, the other thing that's becoming commonplace in this House is that when we get to Budget Day, instead of making real changes to the way the government operates, this government, like many before, just reaches deeper into the pockets of Nova Scotians. That's the story of the budget today, Mr. Speaker. What was all the hullabaloo about? What was all the tough talk about? What was all the bracing people for real change to the way government operates when all that's happening is they're digging deeper into their pockets? That's what the budget shows. So I'll ask the Premier, why did he pick tax increases over real change? The Honourable Premier. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have not uh, chosen tax increases. Mr. Speaker, what we've asked is that all Nova Scotians pay their fair share, and those that have figured out how to incorporate themselves, like chartered accounts, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> should pay their fair share of taxes. We believe that, that in equity across the board. Fact of the matter is, this is a budget that is dealing with the structural challenges facing this province. We've introduced one single health authority, Mr. Speaker, treating our health system as one entity in this province, which will allow us to allow mobility of workers, allow us to maximize the value of the money being spent on that. Mr. Speaker, today we invested in young Nova Scotians in a public education system. Make that move forward. And Mr. Speaker, for far too long, the other two parties believed you threw money at economic development. The fact of the matter is we've cleared up the structural challenges inside of government, and we're going to allow the private sector to drive job growth just as it should be. Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, over the past year, we've seen quite a bit of turmoil in health care in this province. This government was busy picking fights with health care workers while home care wait lists grew by 80%. We have record high waits for long-term care. ICU beds have closed. Nurses have to be flown in from out of province. ERs are overcrowded and closed. Well, Mr. Speaker, this budget does nothing in terms of a prescription to address any of those problems, Mr. Speaker. So my question to the Premier is this. With less than 1% funding increase, for the Department of Health, I want to ask the Premier, what is he going to cut next to maintain this very unrealistic budget plan? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for a question. I want to congratulate the Minister of Health for doing a tremendous job, Mr. Speaker. In these most, in these most, Mr. Speaker, in these most challenging times, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health continued to control his budget, unlike previous Ministers of Health. He's investing in orthopedic surgeries, waitlist, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that more Nova Scotians get that surgery on time, Mr. Speaker. He's putting more money in home support, Mr. Speaker. He's allowing more money to ensure that Nova Scotians get an opportunity to stay in their house longer, Mr. Speaker. Just imagine, just imagine what this government could have done if that government hadn't capitulated and given away $700 million in unrealistic tax and unrealistic wage increases, Mr. Speaker. We could have $200 million more to invest in health care in Nova Scotians. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. The Premier is just being silly when he talks about giving away money. Giving away money to health care providers who provide the care to patients in this province. Mr. Speaker, this budget today shows an increase overall in health care spending of only 0.8 per cent, which means, Mr. Speaker, $33 million. Mr. Speaker, that government has invested more in the Yarmouth Ferry than they're putting into the health care system in Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. I'll ask the uh, Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party to uh, get on with the question and also to retract the term silly in refer reference to the uh, Honourable Premier. That is an unparliamentary term. The Honourable Speaker. Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I certainly apologize for calling the Premier silly. Um, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask what it will take for this Premier and this government to understand what is really needed realistically to provide quality health care to the people of Nova Scotia where and when they need it, Mr. The Speaker. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, there isn't a single Nova Scotian who believes throwing more money at any of the problems facing this province is the solution, Mr. Speaker. We have tried that for far too long. And let me be clear, Mr. Speaker, we're being fair to everyone who works across government, everyone who delivers services to Nova Scotians, and every Nova Scotian are going to have to be part of this journey of getting our province back to fiscal health. Just imagine if we'd had wage increases that kept pace to the growth in our economy instead of exceeding it at the rate the former government did. It would be $200 million we could have in this house to invest in Nova Scotia to provide the kind of tax breaks the other side of the house are looking for, Mr. Speaker. It's about showing leadership and it's about following and spending the money that you have, not spending future growth until you earn it. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on her final supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, from all the havoc Nova Scotians have had to put up with in the health care system since this government came to power, now with this budget they will have to put up with a great deal more as they see patient care continuing to deteriorate, Mr. Speaker. So I want to ask the Premier, when will he admit his distraction with his non-health care plan has resulted in a crisis in health care in this province. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I couldn't disagree more with the uh, leader of the Democratic Party. I want to remind her of the investments we paid in orthopedic wait times, Mr. Speaker. It's a $2 million investment. I want to talk about the $3.7 million that we're investing in home care, Mr. Speaker, not to mention the supports that we're providing to keep people in their homes longer, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to invest in the things that matter to Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, in a sustainable way, one that has lived within our means. The Honourable Member for Picto East. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Finance. Nova Scotians want good jobs here in Nova Scotia. And the Ivory Report highlighted the importance of natural resources to the Nova Scotia economy. Today's budget appears to do nothing to encourage resource development in the province. So I'm left to ask the Minister today, what role does the Minister see for natural resources to generate government revenues? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to answer that question from the member opposite. The, there is tremendous news in today's budget about natural resources. The move to take inspection and, and enforcement activities out of the Department of Natural Resources, along with agriculture and fisheries and other departments, and centralize them will mean that the department will focus solely on the development of the industry, solely on supporting growth, helping to find innovation, helping those sectors to grow and prosper and hire more people in this province, they will not have the policing side of that issue. The Honourable Member for Picto East on his final supplementary. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. And uh, I turn my attention to our, our, our natural gas revenues. The Ivory Report calls on the government to put in place a comprehensive development plan by the end of this year, by the end of 2015. And we know that the government banned onshore gas development, and today we know uh, the dramatic drop in offshore royalty revenues from $40 million down to $19 million. We can see that significant drop. So my question for the minister is, what is the government's plan for uh, sustainable resource development and the much needed jobs that go with it? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Speaker. And uh, turning to the, uh, um, the Energy Department, essentially, is what you're asking about in the offshore oil development. I said in my speech there are two large commitments made here by two different groups of oil companies, $1 billion each for exploration and seismic and geo geoscience work, and that, that will make a huge difference. Exactly. BP and Shell are both committed to this province. You know, we have to, uh, of course, hope that that goes well. The decrease in revenue from this year is about our existing fields, and they, and they have taken a hit, but we have to look forward. We've got great things in the future. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today companies in the film, television, and digital media, uh, media industry were hit with a 75 per cent tax increase. To make matters worse, the government also eliminated film and creative industries Nova Scotia, an organization whose mandate was to promote and grow our film industry. And as a result of these, more than $20 million in cuts to our com um, creative community and over 2,000 jobs province-wide are now at risk. My question for the Premier, could he please explain why he's risking Nova Scotia's successful film, television, and di digital media industry? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. I want to thank uh, all members and those Nova Scotians who continue to uh, give advice to government in the preparation for the budget. I'm pleased to say that the film tax credit, Mr. Speaker, is in place in this province. Uh, what has changed, Mr. Speaker, is that 
uh, it was a, a non-refundable uh, tax credit where they got, uh, Mr. Speaker, 100% of the money, whether they pay taxes in this province. What we've changed is that 25% of it's here. The fact of the matter is the other 75% is there if you pay taxes in this province. All we're asking for is to pay your taxes. We'll be more than happy to give you the credit. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on her final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, today, following the uh, minister's budget, Mark Allman, a very well-known film producer, said that a stake had been driven through the heart of the Nova Scotia film industry, Mr. Speaker, with this budget. So my question to the, minister, to the Premier is this. Why on earth did he refuse to consult with the Nova Scotia film industry before making such a terrible decision <clears throat> that will put at risk many jobs in our province and cost us literally thousands, millions of dollars. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to thank all those Nova Scotians who continue uh, to work in this province, continue to drive economic growth, and continue to provide uh, uh, the, the the, uh, I, I'm looking forward to answering the question from the, from the member from Chester. Uh, when she gets up and asks me one, Mr. Speaker, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but by the, by, the way, Mr. by the way, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, uh, that tax credit is still in place. All we're asking, Mr. Speaker, is that you pay taxes in Nova Scotia. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Pitto East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the uh, Minister of the Environment. The deadline for the Northern Pulp to appeal, to file an appeal on the department's industrial approval has approached. And over the last couple of months, the minister has been unwilling to share with the mill the background information on which his department wrote the industrial approval, leaving the mill in the dark on how a number of requirements were reached. So many people in Pictou County are wondering why the department is being so secretive and questioning whether the department had the proper expertise to draft an industrial approval with the conditions it has. So my question for the minister is, uh, did the minister hire a consultant to help draft the industrial approval? And if so, how much did it cost? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite uh, for the question. Uh, it's uh, clear that uh, the uh, constituents, that the people of Nova Scotia, particularly from his riding and uh, the area <coughs> of Pictou, this is uh, a a question of, uh, of interest and concern. Um, I guess the, the first thing is that I'm, I'm struggling with the, uh, the premise of the first question, suggesting that uh, that uh, have been unwilling or secretive in some form uh, in uh, engaging with uh, the mill or, or the general public with respect to how we uh, came to the uh, position that we did uh, with the industrial approval that went out the door, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so I'm, I'm struggling with that because this was the most transparent process, open and transparent process. Uh, staff uh, engaged uh, as well as senior uh, member deputy with the <coughs> mill officials and the public uh, in creating this uh, IA. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the Minister need not struggle with the question of transparency when he's asked a simple question of whether or not he hired a consultant and you heard his answer. <clears throat> Nothing to do with whether or not he hired a consultant. So I'll ask another question for the minister today. Uh, though the minister has been largely silent on this issue, it now falls back in his hands, uh, it will fall in his hands to decide on whether or not any appeal that's launched uh, goes forward. So uh, it, it, it will be hard for those involved not to wonder if the minister has a conflict of interest in making the decision after his department issued the document to begin with. So uh, my question for the minister is, does the minister really feel that going through a lengthy appeal <coughs> process is a better option than sitting down with the mill and sharing the background information to come up with a solution? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I apologize to the member opposite that I didn't get to uh, answer the question in advance, but I believe members from the other side of the House uh, raised previous points of order with respect to the length of time that we take to answer our question. So I'm trying to adhere to the rules of the, uh, the House, Mr. Speaker. To answer that question, no, I didn't uh, hire a consultant, but we did rely on information from various uh, sources, including consultants, including the mill and the general public, and the expertise that exists within the Department of Environment, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with respect to uh, the second portion of the, the question, Mr. Speaker, uh, with uh, the work that we're doing, uh, it has been very open and transparent, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, I beg the, the, the member opposite, if he's wondering whether we should uh, go through, certainly happy to hear from the member opposite what he wants to do in this situation. 
The Honorable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Poor oral health care drastically affects the seniors' quality of life and their overall health. This issue is particularly troublesome given the challenges with delivering oral health care to those living in long-term care facilities. The Canadian Dental Association has released a number of recommendations to help seniors maintain good oral health. They recommend uh, an oral health screening be performed uh, upon admission, annual examinations by dentists and suitable infrastructures to support the appropriate delivery of needed dental care. So my question to the Minister of Health and Wellness, will the recommendations by the Dental Association <coughs> be included in the Minister's uh, soon-to-be-updated continuing care plan and in the service standards for long-term care delivery? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the member opposite and Foreign Minister of Health uh, asked an excellent question around uh, seniors' uh, dental care. Uh, we will now move on to uh, phase two of a uh, provincial strategy, as well as uh, in the uh, continuing care uh, 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 update. Uh, this is one of those areas uh, probably most likely will be addressed in a comprehensive uh, provincial strategy around uh, oral uh, health care. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much. And I, and I forgot the table of the recommendations from uh, the Dental Association. But, you know, oral health challenges are a sign of the times as more, a growing percentage of our seniors' population has kept more of their natural teeth uh, than in the past. Not only is this a challenge in long-term care facilities, but it's also a growing issue for seniors to remain in their homes. As we know, dental care can be very expensive and sometimes unattainable uh, for those folks. Uh, dental Association recommends that caregivers be trained to recognize the role, role that oral health care plays in our overall health. So my question, again, uh, does the minister consider this a priority and that he has made sure that care policies reflect the needs to address oral health in seniors? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and, and this, is a, this is a very significant uh, area, uh, both for uh, the young members uh, of our population as well as our seniors. Uh, and if the previous government had consulted with the Dental Association, we would have been well underway with a comprehensive oral program in this province. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Hans West. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question through you will be to the Minister of Agriculture. The Minister would be aware, as would many others, that last summer there was a uh, significant tropical storm, Arthur, which caused considerable damage in the apple industry, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I know that the Minister has been contacted, as have other levels of government, to initiate a process of agri-recovery, and I wonder if the Minister could update us this afternoon on where that stands. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This is a very important topic for the uh, apple producers in the province, and fire blight has been introduced to the province uh, as a result of the hurricane last year. And in February uh, this year, we uh, approached the Ag Recovery Program and indeed uh, did start to work with the federal government and taken other steps so far to address this issue in the industry. The Honourable Member for Hans West. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and the Minister for that answer. I would just follow that up with uh, a comment around knowing the timing being very important, that the apple industry is an important piece of our uh, economic development and so on in this province. <coughs> Order, uh, please. The Honourable Member for Hans West has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, uh, to the Minister, I would ask a uh, time frame for the process to be initiated, if he could speak to that based on the importance of this industry and the fact that uh, the apple industry is already well underway and working toward uh, this year's uh, production. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Uh, to give the Honourable Member a more accurate update, and indeed we, uh, we did have a survey that's going to go out. It had to be previewed by Ottawa. That's already been completed. Uh, as of yesterday, uh, Perennia has uh, held some programs around how you treat and deal with fire blight. And on the uh, uh, later this month, we're going to have a uh, mitigation sheet provided to the industry by Perennia and indeed the uh, we've had a uh, close to between two workshops we've had on this we've had over 105 participants already so we're well on the way to addressing this issue it is a serious issue but indeed uh, we have to help the industry every way we can <clears throat> the honorable leader of the new democratic party very much mr. speaker my question for you is to the minister of labor and advanced education. Mr. Speaker, patients 
healthcare providers, film industry folks are not the only casualties in this budget, Mr. Speaker. Nova Scotian students learned today that the 3% cap on tuition increases has been removed for this year, Mr. Speaker. Administration in universities are now free to raise tuition to whatever level they decide, and students will have to shoulder that burden, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to ask the <coughs> Minister of Advanced Education how this particular measure in the budget is acceptable. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, I know that students and families who are struggling with the cost of education, um, for them any increase is stressful and it wasn't a decision made likely. When tuition was frozen a number of years ago, uh, we, some of the universities were, uh, were charging far more than others for, for certain programs. And the result is every year when there was a 3% increase, that uh, disparity was exacerbated. This, uh, this change has, will be brought in to assist those universities that have, uh, in fact, seen a greater disparity over the number of years. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on her final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, with the astronomical increase in administration in the universities over the past number of years, with the large six-figure salaries, one would have thought that the universities should have first been asked to look at their own administration, like has been done in the health care system, Mr. Speaker, but apparently that's not the case. This government is looking to the students who already carry a disproportionate level of debt as they go out into the labor force and is one of the reasons why we end up saying farewell to Nova Scotia to so many of our students, Mr. Speaker. So I want to ask the minister if she will tell this House where in the consultation that she did around the province this was recommended as one of the things that measures that the government should take with respect to university tuition. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to let the Honourable Member know that in the recent Canadian Post-Secondary Performance Impact 2015 report from the Higher Education Quality Council of <coughs> Ontario, Nova Scotia was ranked number one in the country for its access to higher education. And I'll table, I'll table that report. And uh, the, if if the, minister, uh, the former minister was so concerned about the astronomical salaries at, university, at universities among administration, of course, she could have done something to deal with it then. I can guarantee, in fact, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry, does the member for Chester St. Margaret's have Lord, something Lord, she'd Lord, like please. to say? <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education has the floor. And I would like to uh, remind the honourable member that I will be bringing in accountability <laughs> legislation for universities later this session. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The honourable member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Deep, Deep, Pinook, <laughs> Deep Pinook has provided Nova Scotians millions of person hours of employment over the life of the project. It's been a great source of, uh, of employment for people in the energy industry supply chain. And now, with project production uh, slowing, these employment opportunities are in jeopardy. So bearing in mind that full-scale production for the uh, BP and Shell project is years away, my question for the minister is, what is the, what is the minister doing to secure new opportunities for the province's energy supply chain? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Speaker, the department, as is done on an almost annual basis, puts out calls for bids uh, for some of the parcels on our offshore. Uh, that will be done as well as we encourage uh, companies who want to come explore uh, in Nova Scotia. As the member indicated, we're uh, very excited by the opportunities with uh, Shell beginning their exploratory work this summer and certainly look forward to seeing the results of that. Mr. Speaker, uh, as always, uh, the Department of Energy uh, strives to promote our offshore uh, industry and to encourage private companies to come and make investments in our province. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
One way to ease the uh, negative employment pressures from deep Pinook's uh, slowdown is to try to find new ways to create jobs in the short term for the energy industry. And I have an idea for the minister. Developing, developing our onshore resources might just be the way to do that. So my question for the minister is, can we expect the minister to review uh, his ban on fracking uh, that was put in place on onshore natural gas development? And when can we expect that review to happen? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Speaker, part of the success we've had in our offshore has been with the work that was done by previous uh, governments uh, with their support, the uh, Playfair uh, analysis that was done. We're doing the same thing with our onshore and trying to see exactly where are there potential uh, deposits or uh, potential opportunities for uh, energy work to be uh, done on our onshore. Mr. Speaker, it's very important that we be able to have the science behind us to share with all, all interested parties as to where these uh, hydrocarbons or others may be located uh, in our province. Uh, I know, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the official opposition believes in the Gled, uh, Jed Clampett approach of trying to find find hydrocarbons in our province, we'd rather rely on science. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Inverness. It was. Hachinula Tukchen Gavel Luach Aunts Gach Cannon, Agus Dulchus, Savor Roisho, Agus Gavel Eat, Gubanach, Gubuandach, Nan Ur Alabanach Ulla. Mr. Speaker, we understand that all languages and cultures in this province have value and they greatly benefit Nova Scotians. My question to the Minister of Education. In January, the Minister released an action plan. One of the stated goals is to encourage more <coughs> cultural diversity in our schools, and that included a teacher recruitment campaign to attract Acadian, African Nova Scotian, and Mi'kmaq teachers. There is no mention of Gaelic teachers. Mr. Speaker, there is also no mention of Gaelic in the equity education program. Why was Gaelic not included? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I will be checking Hansard to ensure that the member was not speaking ill of the minister as he first started. <laughs> um, it is true in our action plan we did acknowledge the importance of language, culture, and history of African Nova Scotian, Gaelic, Acadian, and Mi'kmaq communities in our province and of the peoples that we have here. It, when we looked at uh, the recruitment, uh, as I have uh, indicated we looked at identifying three of those and omission the Gaelic should have been there. No problem. The Honourable Member for Inverness. It wowers, I can, I can tell you and uh, that minister that I would never speak ill of, of her. Uh, the, report <laughs> the report highlights the need to encourage cultural awareness and I appreciate the minister's comments. Uh, in our school system. And, and one uh, school I've heard of recently that makes me very proud is in Waikagama. They're actually teaching four languages under one roof there, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this, this cannot be done if we leave out cultures that are important to our province. Um, the minister has agreed, I think, to revisit this omission. So in recognizing that uh, we've achieved uh, the goal here, I'm not going to ask a further question. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Premier said that his government was not cutting the dental coverage program for children up to age 17, as he committed in the election with a long lot of other things that have not been done. And immediately after question period, the Health Minister revealed to reporters that he had in fact suspended the program of extending coverage to children up to age 17. Certainly, he did not seem to have informed the Premier of this decision. Therefore, can the Premier explain why his minister didn't inform him that he cut a program that he made a commitment and promise to the people of Nova Scotia during the election? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. And uh, Yesterday I said in this House, in answer to the question, that we have not cut the dental program. Uh, Mr. Speaker, March 31st of this province, every Nova Scotia, young Nova Scotian that was covered by that program is covered by today. Mr. Speaker, what the Minister talked about is an expansion of that program. I want to explain the difference between a cut and expansion. A cut is what they did to Nova Scotia classrooms in the last four years. Mr. Speaker. 
and expansion is the investment we're making in them now. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Mr. Speaker, perhaps I should talk to the Premier about the difference between a broken promise and a commitment over and over and over again in the election that it's going to be expanded to 8 to 17 years of age. Yesterday, when the Minister of Health announced that he had cut the youth dental care program, he also announced that he had stuck a secret, struck a secret review committee to look at the program. I find it interesting with the most open and transparent cover government that they have this secret review committee. So can the Premier tell Nova Scotians when his Minister of Health struck this secret review panel, what the secret review panel is doing, and who sits on the secret review panel? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a commitment is reinvesting the $65 million back in education that we said we were going to A commitment, Mr. Speaker, is restructuring health care, Mr. Speaker, under one board like we said we would do, Mr. Speaker. A commitment, Mr. Speaker, is continuing to get government out of the way and let the private sector grow the economy, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, a broken promise, Mr. Speaker, is raising the HST from 13 to 15 percent. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, Northern Inverness County. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Northern Inverness County was identified by the previous government as a remote region for paving. Each year they would pick three areas. Uh, they would spend about $3 million in each area. Uh, the goal to pave about 30 kilometres in those remote regions. Mr. Speaker, the plant that was established by the previous government was based on an identified need in remote areas. Does the minister still believe that that need exists? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the <coughs> member for her question. Uh, first and foremost, I certainly still believe that we made the right decision to scrap the government paving plant that wasn't in the best interest of Nova Scotia taxpayers, Mr. Speaker. And secondly, look, the reality is, and the member and I and, and many members in this House have had conversations about rural Nova Scotia and all regions of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. We, cert we simply have an infrastructure deficit. The amount of money we spend is significant, but it's nowhere near enough to cover the, the replenishing and the replacement and the rebuilding of the 23,000 kilometres that we have in this province. So certainly rural Nova Scotia, Inverness and Northern Cape Breton, no exception. There's needs, Mr. Speaker. We have our processes. We have our staff on the ground that uh, do assessments, set priorities, and we do the best to fill those on an annual basis. Thank the Honourable Member for Inverness. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I guess I'm hearing from the Minister that he does believe that the need exists. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the only paving in Inverness in the five-year plan that's put out by government each year is on main routes, like Highway 105 and Route 19, uh, Route 395, and there is a section on the Strathmore and Scottsville Road. But, Mr. Speaker, largely there's nothing planned for secondary roads. Can the minister tell us what this government's plan is for people in Inverness County who are driving on these roads that have been established in the past as having a need to be paved in an area that is considered remote, that being northern Inverness County? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I have the sense that I'm going to get the invitation for the annual Inverness road tour. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure uh, the member and I will look forward to that, but uh, the reality is, is that the, the member has a very uh, good working relationship with our staff on the ground, with Steve McDonald and the other officials there with TIR, uh, and, and at the end of the day, we look at what's, what's required, obviously volumes, the, the amount of commercial activity, uh, those important tourism routes, which certainly exist in Inverness and in many areas uh, in the province, but uh, you know, the, the member would know that those priorities are set locally, and it's not just about those capital plan uh, investments and, and items that are listed. It's also about the local road, which is in the RIM uh, budget and other budgets. So uh, I know that uh, the member will continue to work closely with Steve, and we'll have conversations about what that member's priorities are for his, the people he represents. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister of Natural Resources. A report co-authored by Dell Law Student shows that the department is not fulfilling its legal obligations with respect to protecting endangered species in Nova Scotia. And I'll table that in a few seconds, uh, Mr. Speaker. Recovery plans are passed due for more than 20 endangered species. 
Some of these recovery plans are 13 years late. Recovery plans have been completed that have been completed are required to be evaluated every five years, and DNR has yet to evaluate the Moose Recovery Plan since releasing it in 2007. Nova Scotia had enough moose to support a hunt on the mainland until 1981. Bob Bancroft, a wildlife biologist, wrote in the Chronicle Herald, moose management and protection are provincial government responsibilities that have failed. And I'll table that. My question to the minister, will the minister commit to fulfilling his department's lawful requirements to <clears throat> ensure future sustainability of endangered species? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'd love to say when, but uh, I'm still waiting for a walk along the Melmerby Beach that he promised me a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, Mr. Speaker, the report states if there's some reason that the law should be changed, and that's one thing, but to simply not fulfill their legal obligations <clears throat> is obviously not acceptable for a government. The Department of Natural Resources estimates that the mainland moose population has declined more than 85 percent. Hunting and wildlife organizations have been doing their part to combat poaching, but the department needs to show more leadership by addressing the other factors associated with the population decline. A spokesman for the department said a response to the report would be drafted once it was reviewed, nearly two months have passed. My question to the minister, has the minister completed his response and will the minister table it in the House today? <clears throat> the Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, when it comes to the protection of our mainland, mainland moose, that is a priority for our department. Our policies across the board when it comes to forestry, um, economic development on any of our crown lands, um, the role that uh, the, uh, the, 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 policy, the policies we have in place are there to support our moose as best we can. They're setbacks, Mr. Speaker, and, um, and we work closely with our wildlife biologists to ensure we're doing our very best. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Last week, med medical specialists in Nova Scotia were informed their malpractice insurance won't be covered this year by the government in the same way it has been covered in the past. Uh, this has many specialists across our province, especially in rural communities, worried they won't be able to afford to continue working in Nova Scotia. We've received some mixed messages uh, from the Minister on this issue, so I'd like to ask the Minister uh, to clarify. Uh, what percentage of medical malpractice fees does the government plan to cover this year? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in this uh, area of the CMPA uh, fees, uh, they have been uh, at 90%. Uh, at uh, we are currently uh, in, uh, in negotiations, and, uh, and members of the obstetric gynecology uh, area in particular that pays some of the highest uh, malpractice fees in the province know that uh, there would be, uh, you know, there, there would also be coverage uh, from the start of uh, this particular year uh, through once the agreement is signed. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. So, so I'm, I'm hoping what the Minister is saying that he will continue to cover uh, the malpractice insurance. So. Just to be very clear, I mean, we're seeing fees going from about $21,000 to about over $50,000 for these specialists, and many of them, Mr. Speaker, live in rural communities and provide care in rural communities. So we know that there's a negotiation going on, but that could take some time, uh, probably over a year, Mr. Speaker, to come to an agreement. So will the minister commit today that these specialists will continue to get the support until the end of, a, of a, an agreement is made with the government? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I've spoken uh, with, uh, with a number uh, of the obstetrician gynecologists uh, in the province. And when you get fees that uh, increase uh, that dramatically, uh, and especially for those who work part-time, and for, uh, for our GPs, it's uh, indeed uh, of, a, of great concern. Uh, and I know that uh, it is an issue that uh, Doctors Nova Scotia as well will be dealing with uh, in the next day or two. And uh, we hope to uh, get a, a full resolve to this issue. 
<clears throat> the Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. In February, the Department decided to stop pushing through Phase 2 of the Occupational Health and Safety Regulations. Small businesses and employers throughout Nova Scotia told the Department loudly and clearly that these regulations are too complicated and would not work, something raised by my colleague from Pictou Centre last year in the Legislature. The way the Department has bungled the process has created significant delays and shows how out of touch the government is with small business in the province. So my question to the Minister, the Department produced this large and complicated set of regulations and then proceeded to consult employers after the fact. Why didn't the Department work with employers in drafting these regulations in the first place? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do believe that this was, this was produced in consultation. The sa work, workplace safety strategy was part of a, a large consultation, uh, and uh, I, I do appreciate the, the, uh, the work that was done by the member for Pictou Centre in bringing the matter to my attention. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, we just heard that times and limited resources are in government. Departments should allocate resources to the best possible use to achieve the best possible outcomes of the province. During this process, the Department created significant confusion and apprehension for employees and employers of the province. Now we appear to be back to square one. My question to the Minister, how long did it take the Department to draft the flawed Phase II regulations, and could the Minister provide a cost to taxpayers of Nova Scotia for the Department's mismanagement of this file? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, while I appreciate the comments by the honourable member, I do reject his ca uh, characterization of uh, those particular uh, um, regulations, and I will endeavour to get him an accurate figure on that. I believe it was in the $60,000 range, uh, and what we heard what we heard from business was that uh, they felt that we were moving too quickly and uh, on this particular issue, and we listened to business, and I view that as a success. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, my, 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 my first question today is for the Minister of Finance regarding the film and television tax credits. Uh, we've now heard what the government is planning to do, and I have to say that in talking with my peers in the industry, everybody is devastated by this decision of this government. Um, they thought it was going to be bad, but they didn't know how bad, and they're feeling very, very... Uh, uh, they're, they're feeling that they were lied to by the government who promised they would keep the television tax credit for the next five years. So my question for the minister is this, when did they decide they were going to gut the film and television tax credit as they have done? Has it been lately or did they know this all along? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I think it's really important that we start by, the, by stating the fact that film credit remains, the criteria remain, the maximum amount you could ask for is 65% of labour if you're eligible. None of those criteria have changed. The difference is how it will be paid out, Mr. Speaker. That's the one difference. We're asking that the industry look at this, move forward with us, and find ways to remain vibrant and here in the province. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. You know, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer, and I know it's very difficult being a minister in a government, especially a majority government, where you need to toe the line and do whatever is the you're told to do. However, I, I also know she understands the importance of this industry to Nova Scotia. What I don't think that she understands is that this is going to devastate the industry. And so my next question is for the Premier. And that is, does the Premier actually understand why the film tax credit is set up the way it is? Because right now, Nova Scotia is again at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to film tax credits in Canada. And Ontario, for instance, has a 35% tax credit plus stackables on top of that. So we are now at the bottom of the list, and that means our productions are going to go elsewhere. So how does the Premier decide? How does the Premier suggest they're going to actually grow our creative economy in this environment? The Honourable Premier. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I again want to echo what the Minister of Finance says. The criteria for the film tax credit is to, has not changed, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you're still eligible for 50 percent uh, tax credit and 65 uh, percent in certain, ca certain conditions, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, uh, in this province, how it's delivered has changed. Uh, 25 percent of it is, is Mr. Speaker, I, it's, it's like the former government used to say about a, 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 for, a forgivable loan. We used to call those grants, Mr. Speaker. This is not a tax credit. It's a non-refundable tax credit, Mr. Speaker. We put it out the door without anyone paying taxes. Do they actually think? Do they actually think that we provide services to Nova Scotians without taxable income? What do they tell for autistic children? We don't have any money to invest you because we're giving non-forgivable grants, Mr. Speaker. What do they tell for those people on wait lists, Mr. Speaker? We don't have any money because we're giving non-forgivable grants, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, we've continued to invest in these tax Order, credits. Order, please. The Honourable Premier has the floor. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, the film tax credit still exists in this province. We're going to continue to move forward, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very proud of the fact that we've created, Mr. Speaker, another fund for the cre creative economy, Mr. Order, Speaker, please. that will be brought in. Order, for oral questions by <laughs> members to ministers has expired. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise on a point of order. During question period today, the Minister of Energy referred to our policy on onshore gas development as the jet clampet approach. That actually does raise a very important question of order, Mr. Speaker, because as you will know, Jed Clampett was a very rich man who lived in a big mansion, <laughs> and he had a cement pond, Mr. Speaker, as you may recall. Had Jed Clampett lived in the province of Nova Scotia under that minister and this government, he would be poor indeed <coughs> because his source of income would be banned, and so I asked the minister to retract his remarks. That's not a point of order. That's a disagreement of television facts. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Uh, in the East Gallery today, we are joined by former MLA for uh, Timberley Prospect and former Cabinet Minister, the Honourable Bruce Holland. I ask that the House join me in giving him a warm welcome. So now I'll take a two minute recess.
We'll now resume with the daily routine. We'll move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, Mr. Speaker, would you please call uh, bills for second reading? We'll now call bi public, uh, bills for second reading. Mr. Speaker, would you please call Bill No. 80, the House of Assembly Act? We'll now call Bill No. 80, the House of Assembly Act. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill No. 80, the House of Assembly Act, be now read a second time. Motion is for Bill No. 80, the House of Assembly Act, to be read a second time. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye? aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill No. 80, entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 1, 1992, Supplement of the Revised Statutes, 1989, the House of <coughs> Assembly Act. Ordered that the bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honorable Government House Leader. Speaker, would you please call Bill No. 82, the Change of Name Act and Vital Statistics Act. We'll now call Bill No. 82, the Change of Name Act and Vital Statistics the Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia, Municipal Affairs and Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill No. 82, an act to amend Chapter 66 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Change of Name Act, and Chapter 494 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Vital Statistics Act, be read for a second time. Mr. Mr. Speaker, it's my pleasure to rise in the House today to speak to these amendments. Mr. Speaker, in last fall's House session, a petition signed by over 600 Nova Scotians who want to see a change to the Nova Scotia Vital Statistics Act was tabled in the legislature by my colleague from Halifax, Shibukto, and I want to thank him for his efforts and support on this particular bill. The Act currently requires you to confirm that you had sex reassignment surgery in order to change the sex on a birth certificate. Last fall, I made a commitment to eliminate this requirement, and today I'm delivering on that promise. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to introduce amendments to the Vital Statistics Act that remove the requirement for Nova Scotians to have sex reassignment surgery to change the sex designation on their birth certificate. I'm also introducing an amendment to the Change of Name Act to eliminate the requirement for parental consent for minors who are 16 to 18 to align with the changes to the Vital Statistics Act. Mr. Speaker, as Nova Scotians, we respect human dignity and we expect to be treated in a respectful, non-judgmental manner when we shop, go to the movies, show our driver's license to a police officer, or present ID to enter a drinking establishment. Constantly proving one's status is not something that many Nova Scotians have to face on a daily basis. Every day, transgendered individuals have to open themselves up to the judgment of others in a way that most of us cannot understand. Mr. Speaker, imagine if you entered a store, just like all of us do every day, and you had to present an identification to make a purchase. Now, Mr. Speaker, imagine you're an individual who identifies with a gender that is different than what's stated on your ID card. The act is so routine to us, Mr. Speaker, yet transgender individuals may experience panic, fear, vulnerability, at what the store owner may think or how they might react to the difference. Anxiety that their IDs don't match who they are is a reality for transgender Nova Scotians. Some people, who don't, who, some people do not identify with any or all of the aspects of genders assigned to them at birth. Mr. Speaker, these amendments won't just change the sex on a birth certificate. This will provide needed peace of mind and confidence to transgender Nova Scotians. We take gender equity seriously, Mr. Speaker and we're taking steps to ensure this is ref reflected in our laws. During my policing career, Mr. Speaker, I often worked with vulnerable youth. As we all know, because we've all been teenagers, life is full of challenges for our youth. Mr. Speaker, I've seen firsthand the challenges that transgender youth can face and how these can make them vulnerable and at serious risk. That is why anything we can do as a government to ensure this doesn't happen is so important. We need to do what we can to, improve the, to remove the challenges and empower our youth to reach their full potential. These amendments aren't just helping youth, Mr. Speaker, they're helping transgender Nova Scotians of all ages. Transgender people are still disadvantaged as a demographic. They are likely to experience harassment because of their gender status, 
and we need to make sure that all Nova Scotians are free from discrimination, and this change is a step in the right direction. <laughs> Amendments, <laughs> Amendments to the Vital Statistics Act include the elimination, eliminating the requirement for sex reassignment surgery to change the sex designation on a birth certificate, requiring a self-declaration from the applicant stating they have assumed identity with and, to, and intend to live in a gender identity that corresponds with the desired sex designation, requiring a letter of support from a person with a professional designation as defined in regulations, such as a doctor, a nurse, a social worker, or a psychologist, and requiring minors, <laughs> requiring minors under 16 to have parental consent. The letter of support must be from a doctor or psychologist that has treated or evaluated the applicant and must include a professional opinion that the minor has the capacity to understand the impacts of the decision. The amendment under the Change of Name Act will reduce the age requirement for parental consent to age 15 to align with the Vital Statistics Act. Most importantly, Mr. Speaker, these amendments respond to concerns raised by the transgender community. Having a government-issued ID that doesn't reflect the person's true gender leaves them vulnerable to harassment and discrimination, be that when they travel, go to a bar, or a movie. Mr. Speaker, we are removing a significant barrier for the transgender community. I'm taking this action because it is the right thing to do to ensure that transgender Nova Scotians feel safe, secure, and proud of their identity and proud of their community. Transgender Nova Scotians can feel disrespect, discrimination, and violence most of us cannot understand. Mr. Speaker, if we can alleviate some of this risk by making these simple changes, then it is the right thing to do. With that, Mr. Speaker, I conclude my comments and look forward to listening to the comments of other members in the House. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it gives me pleasure to rise to my feet today to discuss this, um, this bill. Uh, I'm very much in favour of it. I think it's... Uh, yeah. I think, it's a, I think it's a great bill, and it's, it's following along in what we set in motion as the NDP government several years ago uh, when we made it uh, possible for um, amendments to the Human Rights Act that protect transgender people from discrimination. We did that in 2012, and we approved covering the cost for reassignment surgeries also in 2012. And uh, I think it's great that now guidelines are being developed for schools and school boards to create a culture that's safe, respectful, and supportive of transgender and gender non-conforming students. And I am very glad that we are committed to bring forward amendments for this new requirements to change the sex on a birth certificate during our session right now, our spring session. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, when I first became an MLA in, uh, in Truro, one of my first assignments was uh, a couple of people came into my office who needed, um, they needed to have their birth certificates found and they also needed their names changed. One young woman uh, had been moved around from foster homes to foster homes and she'd basically lost her identity. Um, she was having terrible trouble with uh, some drugs and alcohol problems and also abuse suffered in foster homes and uh, she was a really lost soul. And she didn't have any proof of who she was. She had no ID. And so I took it upon myself and my staff to help her try and find her identity, basically, and to help her get her life straightened out. And as an MLA in, um, you know, in this house, I think these are the types of jobs and these types of projects that really make us feel good about what we're doing. You know, when you can help make one person's life a little easier and a little better and make them feel good about themselves, uh, and especially being a woman and caring about women's issues and other women who are having trouble out there in the world, having trouble getting jobs, having troubles, you know, with their, with their lives. And, and again, identity is a very important thing for everybody. So um, I managed to help this young woman get her life together. It took a long time. And we even managed to get her a, a name change. She wanted to have her name changed because she had several different last names from all the different homes she'd been in. And 
She wanted to choose which name she wanted to go with for the rest of her life, and I helped her to do that. Uh, however, then I had another uh, person come into my office who uh, was a gentleman who wanted to be a woman and felt that he is a woman. And uh, in fact, she uh, wanted a name change and was told by the community services department that in fact, that it was impossible, that she did not uh, fit the requirements and could not have her name changed. But she felt that she was a woman. She dressed like a woman. She was waiting for surgery and wanted to be assigned. And uh, so I felt that it, there was a discrepancy here and uh, some injustice that was being done. And also that it was, it was discriminatory uh, in the attitude between one person versus the other who deserves to have their name change paid for when they are on income assistance and who doesn't. And so again, we fought long and hard, and we got, we managed to get permission to change this person's name. And now she has a female name and is really proud of herself because she can actually have the name that she identifies with. Um, again, these are the types of things that I think are new for some people in not just Nova Scotia, but around the world. And here in Nova Scotia, I think many people, it's new, the whole idea of gender being on a whole um, uh, a line, that there's many different types of genders and a mixture of genders. And that, in fact, most people, you have your mother and your father inside of you. And so some people can identify more with one than the other, and some people have both. And so. Um, one of the things that I'm the most proud of doing in my years, in my six years in government, is helping people like this to, to, um, to find themselves. So my, um, my other experience with this uh, first began when I was uh, a young actor coming up the ranks, living in Toronto, partly because there was no film work or television work in Nova Scotia, so I had to go to Toronto. And one of my very first friends, one of my very first best friends in the industry was a person named Craig Russell. Uh, people in the industry would remember him, but his name has, he's, he's not as talked about as much anymore. He was a female impersonator. And he did a movie called Outrageous. And then he did a second movie called Too Outrageous. And uh, Craig always prided himself because he was a man but he said he had 16 different women trapped inside of him. And so he never wanted to have the, a sex change operation, but he said, you try living with 16 different women trapped inside of you and see how you do in society. Um, but he, he used it to his advantage because he became a very, he was a hairstylist in Toronto, but he loved um, many famous women including Mae West. Mae West was his hero. And he became the president of the Mae West Fan Club of Canada. And he was 19 years old at the time, and he wrote to Mae, Mae West in Hollywood and kept her abreast of what he was doing in her, for her, all the meetings he was having and things like this in, in her honor. And he finally asked her, you know, he would love to be able to work for her. And Mae West, after you know a year or two of hearing from this young man, Craig Russell, said, well, you, I will, if I put a, you on a bus, if I send you a bus ticket to Hollywood, you get on the bus, we'll be waiting for you at the end, and I'll give you a job as my personal assistant. So young Craig Russell from Toronto, Ontario, got on a Greyhound bus and ended up in Hollywood for the first time, where he was Mae West's personal assistant. And he got to talk to people like Marlena Dietrich, uh, all kinds of people on the phone that would call her and come to visit her. And at the time, she was older, and she had uh, a stable of young men that were very handsome that came and s went around her pool and used her pool. And she she just encouraged them to come around, and it helped her uh, her image, I'm sure. And it also was part of who she was, because she identified herself as one of the first early sex symbols, really, of. Uh, of North America, and uh, the gay community loved her because she got it. She really got it at a, at a time when a lot of people didn't. She was a vaudeville star. She'd worked with many different types of people on the, on, on the circuit. 
and she was welcoming. She was like the Liz Taylor, really, of her day, uh, where she welcomed and accepted and, and uh, encouraged people to be themselves. And so young Craig Russell actually learned how to impersonate May. He was one, she was one of his first impersonations. And then he went on from there to learn how to do Marlena Dietrich. He did Barbara Streisand. He did Janis Joplin. He did, um, oh my god, Liza Minnelli. He did a whole lot of them. And then by the time uh, I actually met him, he was already a movie star by this time, and he'd done shows at Lincoln Center. And he was one of the first people in Canada who got the name out for transgenders, for, um, for female impersonators, to start to give them some dignity and to make them proud of themselves and proud of who they were and proud of coming out on Gay Pride Day and, and shouting out and, being, and saying, I am who I am and I'm proud of it. I met him when I was 20. I had just done uh, the Marilyn Monroe uh, musical called Hey Marilyn that I starred in in Edmonton and I'd done my first film called uh, The Hounds of Notre Dame in Wilcox, Saskatchewan. And uh, I met him at the Toronto Actra Film Awards where he was, uh, had been hired to play uh, Judy Garland, that was one of his characters, he was playing Judy Garland at this awards ceremony and they had asked me to come in and play Marilyn Monroe. And at the very first um, rehearsal that we did for the awards ceremony, I showed up and they announced that I was there and I heard this voice from the front of the house going, where is she? Let me see this girl who can play Marilyn Monroe. You know, she's my competition. I want to look at her in the eyes. And up came Craig and he had a feather boa on and he had a bunch of different things on. He had, I think he had his Mae West wig on and he had his nails and some dark glasses in the theater and very, very eccentric and wonderful. And so I said, hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Lenore and I play Marilyn and I, you know, I don't dress like Marilyn. I don't put the makeup on in my real life, but yeah, I play Marilyn. So we met, we sat down together. He said, well, I want to talk to you. And I looked at him and I said, take your dark glasses off. I said, I want to see your eyes. And he goes, why, why? And I said, well, Craig, I want to see your eyes because I want to know who you are. I don't want to meet Mae West. I don't want to meet Judy Garland. I don't want to meet any of your 16 women that are trapped inside you. I want to meet you because you're the one that's important. So he took off his glasses very tentatively, timidly, and he looked me in the eyes, and he had these beautiful blue eyes. And I said, oh, my God. I said, you have the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen. And he said, really? I said, yeah. I said, you're beautiful. You're a handsome man, and you're a beautiful woman. Uh, I said, and you've got the best legs I've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, he, he changed. He became softer. He became himself. And he felt totally accepted by me. And we became best friends from then on. And he actually said he was never going to play Marilyn Monroe ever again because he felt that I played her better. And he never did touch Marilyn Monroe ever again. But he had me to his shows, and he had me come and visit him in Los Angeles. And then my first visit to Hollywood was to visit him. And um, as I was taken to all the different clubs and shows in Hollywood, where he was, I mean, he was a star. He had a limousine. He had fur coats, mink coats. He had coats made for me and for him, and we'd go to these different things. I mean, it was really fun for a young Nova Scotian woman to be feted and introduced to Hollywood in this way. He also took me to the underbelly of Hollywood where the gay clubs were, were just rife with life and pulsating with energy and enthusiasm and all kinds of young men and young women who were just starting to really appreciate who they were and not be afraid to come out and talk about it. And so one night he did a show, and, and this relates to this bill, Mr. Speaker, because Again, it talks about who people really are and their identity and how important this is. I saw the show. He was, he was so good that night. People loved him. They threw roses on the stage. Backstage, he got buckets of roses sent. All kinds of people lined up wanting to see him, tell him what a, what a wonderful star he was. But he wouldn't come out of his dressing room. So. I knocked on the door, and he went, who is it? And I said, oh, it's, it's Lenore. And he went, oh, OK, well, come in. I came in, and he had tears streaming down his face. 
black mascara all over the place, just in a mess. And then he threw himself at his dressing table and he said, oh my God, I can't take it anymore. And I said, well, Craig, what's wrong? He says, I said, they love you out there. What's, what's the problem? And he goes, they don't love me. They love them. They love her. They don't love me. And I said, no, I said, Craig, you are each of these people. You are the essence of these people. You're underneath these people. The people out there that are clapping, they're clapping for you. They're not clapping for Barbara Streisand or Mae West or any of these people. They love you and I love you. You are a special and unique and talented human being. And you need to start to love yourself. And I know I've talked about this theme in this house before when it comes to mental health issues, things like this. But I think that that is really, really important for our society as a whole, for people that are struggling with their identity, for people who are struggling with mental health issues, for people who are struggling with uh, substance abuse issues. Until we learn that we can't fill the gaping hole inside of ourselves with outside things, with drugs or alcohol or the attention of others or fame or fortune or money or power, it doesn't make any difference. You can fill it up with all that stuff and it'll still be a black hole that's empty that is, you, you cannot, you, it will never be filled. The only thing that will fill it is your own self-acceptance, self-love, and stop looking for approval from others. And that was my, 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 my lesson for him. And here I was, 20 years old. He was 36 or something. But the one thing that I've always had is that, uh, you know, a compass, an inner compass, uh, what my, my colleague uh, from uh, the South Shore would call, uh, from Queen Shelby, would call a dead reckoning. Dead reckoning. It's a, it's, a, it's a nautical term, but I relate to it. Because without that dead reckoning, you're adrift at sea. You have nothing. You're just floating around looking for what? Looking for yourself, looking for the purpose of life, looking for what? So I think we all need to realize that that dead reckoning is so important for each and every individual in our society, including ourselves here in this room. And so um, I would just like to end on the note that um, Fi helping our constituents and the people of Nova Scotia find their own identity and accept themselves and for us to embrace them and to celebrate them and to give them all the encouragement we can to, to not be afraid to come out and be who they are and do it in the schools, do it right from day one and primary on and encourage them to find out who they are and to pass these kinds of laws that help them. Uh, that's what I'm here for, and that's what I'm proud of being an MLA in this, uh, in this government. So um, with that, uh, I will take my place, and uh, I do thank the government for this bill. Thank you very much. If I'm to recognize the Honorable, oh, we have another speaker. The Honorable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's a real honour to stand here today and speak on these extremely important amendments. Amendments that may seem like simple and straightforward changes to a piece of legislation, but are quite possibly some that I am the most proud of. As you know, Mr. Speaker, I'm a teacher. However, for the past eight years, I've also been a guidance counsellor, working in mental health awareness and preventative measures. Working every day first with elementary age children, and then for the last five years before entering politics, high schoolers. I would help, or try to help, with every sort of problem imaginable. Some simple, and some more complex than I could ever comprehend. The one common thread that connected each of these many children, however, was the desire to just fit in, to be quote unquote normal. Any teen who doesn't fit the cultural mold we as a society subconsciously create for them face unimaginable stress, anxiety, and even deep despair. Transgendered children and youth are some of the most vulnerable of this group. That's why I'm so proud of these amendments. We as a province have an obligation to ease some of the burden felt by these individuals. We as a society, though, also have to start changing how we define the mold for each other. 
We as a government cannot eliminate the harassment and discrimination felt and suffered by transgendered people in our society, but we can certainly do our part to lessen them. These amendments also address an issue that is faced by a much larger portion of our province, and that is the issue of accessibility. Most spe specifically, the amendment that adds social workers to the list of professionals able to write a letter of support for transgendered people. School is a constant in what can be a very stable lives of young people, and unfortunately, it's still not always a guarantee. Social workers come into our schools, they are able to counsel our children on a regular basis, and they are sometimes the only professionals our young people have regular access to. This may seem like a minor detail, but is really so very vital. As a whole, these amendments return dignity to our transgender community. They remove one of the challenges faced by our youth. They ensure gender equity is reflected in our laws, and they strive to help empower them, and as my colleague has stated, allow them to reach their full potential. Mr. Speaker, our transgendered population is greater than the 600 names listed on the petition delivered to my colleague. I firmly believe that these changes will bring awareness to our province on the rights of this community, will help change our narrative on what we perceive to be quote unquote normal, and most importantly, will give all of our transgendered community hope. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Shibukto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, last year, um, at the request of a transgender lady from Halifax, Shibukto, uh, Jessica Dempsey, I signed a petition calling on the province to make it easier for transgender Nova Scotians to change the sex designation on the birth certificate. And I have to say, when I first met Jessica, I had no idea what the meeting was about. And as I sat and I listened to her stories of, of trying to be self-identified and listening to her um, describe trying to go into a bar, being herself, with the wrong identification on the birth certificate. I couldn't believe that this kind of discrimination was still in existence. And I have to say, when, when I had this opportunity to bring this petition forward, I was honored. And you know, as an MLA, we don't, we don't ever get to an opportunity, really, sometimes, to see an issue and see that issue all the way through. And that's what I have to commend on my government, because we brought this issue to the table, and right away it was dealt with. And that's a, spe that's a pretty amazing thing to watch that process, but also watch the transgender community and our government work together to draft this legislation so that everybody worked together to, to come to an end to an agreement where social workers are now part of this discussion, parents are now part of this discussion, and creating a, a way safer environment for transgender folks in Nova Scotia. And that, to me, is one of the most amazing things, is being an MLA, to watch that process and be part of that process. So when we bring this, this bill forward and, and standing here today to discuss it, it's an honour. It's a huge honour because we're making change and we're making great change for Nova Scotians and for people who, who have that right to be identified as who they want to be. And, you know, those are things that are pretty amazing and I'm, I'm honoured to be part of a party that has done that. You know, the, the ability for a, a child who's under 16 who's struggling with their identity, to have an ability and outlet to, through their education process, through a social worker, is, is also pretty neat because sometimes their safe environment may not be at home, where they have a home environment where they don't understand, where this child can self-identify as a transgender and go to the, ho to the school and ask for help and they can help. That's pretty, pretty special. And you know, and by that, one, we become one of the leaders in Canada and this kind of a legislation, and that's even cooler because that shows that Nova Scotia is ahead of the game on these issues, and that to me is so instrumental in making Nova Scotia thrive and become a better place of equality. You know, this is um, the amendment and the change of the name of the act will reduce the age requirement, and I just spoke to that a bit about that, and I guess I need to adjust that again because I. You know, when I spoke to the minister about this and there was some discussion about why, where, where are children most vulnerable? Well, they're under the age of under 16. And at that age, when they're sitting there talking and trying to figure themselves, society has a lot of strains on them. There is cyberbullying. There is all these, these things that we can't, we can't really understand because we're not in their situation and not in their place and in their shoes. And, and so having the ability to access a social worker is, is amazing. You know, and 
and when I got to, to deliver that petition, um, you know, the petition wrote, um, the operating clause wrote, the petition is to make it easier for transgender citizens of Nova Scotia to change their legal sex designation on birth certificates. I was honored to put my name to that. And with that, I'm going to take my place because I want to keep it short, but I wanted to acknowledge that this is the right thing for Nova Scotians. <clears throat> the Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, one of my uh, assistants had prepared notes for me to speak to this, but this is something that's personal to me. Um, it's personal to me as an MLA, it's personal to me as a minister, uh, but most importantly, it's personal to me um, because I have experienced and still do experience homophobia very much in society. Um, I don't get attacked for the decisions I make. I don't get attacked for the fact that I'm a woman. What I do get attacked for uh, in my constituency office, at my caucus office, outside in the legislature as, as late as last week with vile comments about something that's very personal to me is the fact that I'm married to a woman and I'm openly gay. And so when this legislation came forward, I experienced homophobia, but of course, comfortable in my gender, comfortable in my sexual orientation. I've never experienced transphobia, but I have many people in my life who have. So the fact that we are moving incrementally forward, and I commend the previous government for the gains that they made. They were the right thing to do. It didn't involve politics, and I'm very proud to be a member of this legislature for that. So I'm so pleased that this uh, legislation is going through because I know what young people who have been kicked out uh, because of their sexual orientation, because of their gender identity, uh, not supported by families who become extraordinarily vulnerable uh, to, to uh, all kinds of, of, of predators and individuals and circumstances in society. Uh, I am hopeful that this piece of legislation will uh, move those young people forward in claiming uh, <coughs> what is very personable, uh, or personal to most of us, our gender, our sexual, sexual identity, our sexual orientation. Um, so I applaud uh, my colleague, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, who's been a staunch supporter, and my caucus colleagues um, and, and other members of the, of the other two political parties and for the gains that have been made over the years. And we will continue to make, uh, because quite frankly, it's a human rights issue. Um, and we're, we're, all, we're all elected here uh, to make sure that everybody has the same rights in this province. So with those few words, I'll, I'll take my leave, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I'm to recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs, Service, Nova Scotia and Business, it will be to close debate on second reading of Bill No. 82, the Change of Name Act and Vital Statistics Act. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to close debate on Bill No. 82, an act to amend Chapter 66 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Change of Name Act and Chapter 494 of the Revised Statutes 1989 of the Vital Statistics Act. I do want to thank uh, my colleagues on both sides of the House uh, for their uh, comments and their support uh, for this piece of legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> the motion is for a second reading of Bill No. 82, the Change of Name Act and Vital Statistics Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill No. 82, entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 66 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Change of Name Act, and Chapter 494 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Vital Statistics Act. Ordered that the bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, speaker, would you please call Bill No. 83, the Elections Act. <clears throat> we'll now call Bill No. 83, the Elections Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill 83, Amendments to the Nova Scotia Elections Act, be now read a second time. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity this afternoon to rise in this House and to speak to some of the important amendments that uh, uh, are being introduced in this Act. 
These changes are, are all about maintaining the integrity of our elections while improving access to voting for electors, improving the electoral process and making practical amendments. These changes focus on improving accessibility to electoral processes for voters, allowing Elections Nova Scotia to make changes to improve and modernize administration and election processes, and to further ensure that elections in Nova Scotia are transparent and impartial. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to say these amendments include extending advanced voting opportunities from two to seven days permitting constituents to vote at any returning office or advanced voting location in the province, improving ballots as the reliance on write-in ballots has resulted in ballot error in the past, with increased voting opportunities which allow voters to cast their ballot anywhere in the province, the on-demand printing of ballots will be used in an effort to reduce ballot error. Mr. Speaker, this means that when voters go to cast their vote, the ballot will be printed on demand to ensure the proper candidate's name and their party are listed. Mr. Speaker, the close of nominations will be earlier. It will be moved back from the 14th to the 20th day before Election Day. This will help Elections Nova Scotia be better prepared and with minimal impact to, on candidates. I'm pleased to say that we are adapting to the increasing use of technology, Mr. Speaker. Voters will now be able to register online. Scrutineers, which will now be called scrutineers, will also be able to receive and provide information via texting and email to their campaign colleagues without leaving the poll or disrupting voting. This allows scrutineers to efficiently communicate with their campaign headquarters. In keeping with modern forms of advertising, including social media and websites, the ban of advertising on Election Day will be lifted. We are all familiar with the increasing use of social media, Mr. Speaker. During the past provincial election, photos were taken of marked ballots and posted to social media. There was much debate in the media about the practice and the lack of clarity in the legislation. To protect the sanctity of the secret ballot, changes to the Act will strictly prohibit the use of, use of communications and recording devices to photograph marked ballots. A secret ballot is a very important part of a well-functioning democracy. In fact, I've heard it said that it's the cornerstone of democracy, Mr. Speaker. The members of the House and future candidates listening at home will also be pleased to learn that these changes include improved provisions for candidates and their campaigns. All candidates may continue to receive employment remuneration during an election period. The 200 deposit will also be returned to all candidates based on financial reporting by the candidate's official agents. These amendments are based on the recommendations of the Chief Electoral Officer following the provincial general election held in October 2013. These recommendations were made by Elections Nova Scotia in consultation with the Election Commission the caucuses of the parties with representation in the House of Assembly, and among others. Mr. Speaker, this bill represents a positive step forward for Nova Scotians as voting opportunities are extended, ballots are improved, and accessibility for candidates has been enhanced. I believe these amendments provide Nova Scotia with much-needed practical amendments that is responsive to the needs of a modern electorate given the rapid changes in technology and the increasing mobility of voters. Mr. Speaker, with that, I now conclude my remarks and look forward to listening to comments from other members in the House. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we uh, support in principle this bill. Um, 
And uh, I know that Elections Nova Scotia, in their report and their recommendations that they offered to government, uh, most of them are being put forward here, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, there are a couple of items that I will comment on. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, I can think of one thing I think all of us who, uh, who were incumbents in the last election that will appreciate is not having to hang a, uh, a blanket or some other object over our signs <laughs> for our constituency offices. I remember that was something that uh, came on pretty much at the start of the campaign and I remember trying to get up in the back of a pickup truck to put something over the front of my sign. And, um, it was uh, certainly inconvenient in terms of trying to be running in the middle of a campaign and also people were questioning, well, you're still the MLA, um, why are you covering up the sign to your office? So um, I think that is a good change, it's uh, one that serves a good practical purpose and um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's a good change. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, one of the other issues mentioned was uh, the requirement that candidates be nominated. Uh, 20 days before the election, which is going to be a, an earlier date. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this does give uh, a bit of an advantage to the government because the government will know when the election will happen. And uh, I will say that I think all political parties and anybody who is contemplating running in an election should have an idea that they're going to run well in advance. But, Mr. Speaker, there's no question, I think every, every political party in the province has faced, at least at one time or another, that they may not have a candidate ready to run uh, when the election is called. Um, the government has the advantage. Um, if we are not going to have fixed election dates, the government does have the advantage to be able to know when the election call is going to happen to make sure their candidates are ready. Opposition parties or independents who are running don't, so, uh, or independents who plan to run don't. So. Uh, that is something that I can understand uh, may provide uh, um, ease of administration for elections in Nova Scotia, but it does add uh, a measure of unfairness, I think, for uh, parties that are running going into an election in opposition status. So, um, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to say too much further at this point. Uh, I look forward to hearing if anybody does come forward in law amendments and uh, look forward to, to hearing other comments by other members here in the legislature. Thank you. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbequid. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I just have a few uh, brief comments on, uh, on Bill 83. I think it is important uh, you know, to recognize once uh, we go through a general election that there may be uh, some issues that arise uh, due to rules that are in place. And uh, I think the Minister uh, mentioned a number of them uh, that uh, I uh, recognized and our party recognized in the last uh, general election that uh, had, an, had an, an effect on the overall uh, running of that election. So it is important that we continue to update uh, our Elections Act and ensure that uh, you know, we modernize and keep up with what the trends are. And, and I think some of them were referred to around social media and, elect and the use of electronics as uh, all of us here and, and those who might choose to run in the next election and those candidates that will, uh, will seek a nomination, Mr. Speaker, will do. Uh, but with any changes, of course, uh, you know, we received this bill uh, just a, a few days ago and uh, you know, it is, there is uh, quite a bit of information in there. Uh, like many parties, I would assume, uh, we go and seek input from uh, our caucus, our, our members in our party, uh, those who have uh, uh, much more knowledge than maybe some of us around, uh, around some of the uh, legality of, of hosting elections and changing rules and what impact that has. So we're, we're taking part in that now, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we do want to see this piece of legislation move through, uh, uh, move through the process not uh, at the speed of light, uh, which I've been given some assurance uh, from, the, uh, from the, uh, uh, the government house leader that uh, this will be called for, for I believe, a Monday, uh, law amendments uh, on Monday, which will hopefully give us some time to uh, seek out some of that advice that we're looking for. So at this time, we do reserve our support on Bill 83, but by no means do we want to see it blocked uh, through the process. So we do look forward to, uh, to law amendments. 
to those in our communities across the province who have a, a deep interest in this, uh, in, in, in changes with election acts. I'm sure that all of our caucuses will hear from, uh, from those members uh, and we'll, uh, we'll see how that uh, transpires as we move this along. So thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. If I'm to recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice, it will be to close second reading. Oh. We have the Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, my comments will be short, but I, I feel that it is important to, uh, to voice one of the things that I feel is missing from this piece of legislation. Uh, and that, of course, is the whole issue of fixed election dates. <clears throat> something that the Premier had mentioned many times when he was in opposition, something that he said that he would do when he was running his campaign. I believe that this piece of legislation is an important piece of legislation and the fact that it makes it easier for anyone in Nova Scotia to have an opportunity to exercise their right to vote is very important. But I also heard a government that said that they were open and transparent. And part of that open and transparency would be if you had a fixed election date. The, uh, the person responsible for elections in Nova Scotia has said on several occasions and a fixed election date would allow him to better manage his resources and the number of dollars that it costs for the operation of his organization. So I can't help but wonder, with such an important piece of legislation coming forward, with a government that says they're so open and transparent, with an issue that could save the taxpayers money, which seems to be the, the vein and the vent of what was being said here all along today why, indeed, the government would leave out something as important as a fixed election date. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> if I'm to recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice, it will be to close debate on second reading for Bill No. 83, the Elections Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll just address the couple of points that were raised today, uh, and then when I conclude, obviously, this is going to law amendments, so we, we look forward to hearing any and other comments raised from the public and uh, from both opposition at that point in time, and certainly willing to talk about uh, anything else they would like to talk about. But the two points I will uh, just raise right now is the earlier close of nominations that has been uh, recommended by the <coughs> chief electoral officers to, uh, to move it back six days from the 14th uh, day to the 20th day. The recommendation received Tell, uh, tells us that the 2013 experience, um, the impact of that on political parties of the change was very minimal. Uh, virtually all of the nomination meetings had occurred in advance of this date. Of the 176 candidates who ran, only 34 completed the process after they 20, and 24 of them did it, uh, and, and uh, of those, 24 were within the next three days. So, uh, according to the chief electoral officer and the stats that they have, uh, they believe that's certainly doable. And not only that, it uh, would increase the use of the on-demand printing of ballots with both the candidates' names and their party affiliation, uh, which I'm sh uh, I, like everyone in this house, ran last time. And I know the complications that has uh, taken. And, uh, for anybody who attended the briefing, the, me uh, the media briefing with the electoral officer, he described the number of ballots that had to be uh, voided due to the fact that people came in to vote, either wrote the, uh, the name, the, they wrote the name of the uh, adjoining constituency candidate, or they wrote the wrong party name or anything of that. So they're really trying to fix that for next election. The uh, final point that I will speak on is this uh, fixed election date. Um, my comments that were made uh, at the briefing, which I'm not sure how much was picked up or not, but and I don't know how many of you were there, but I can tell you that we carefully considered all of the recommendation. We certainly considered the fi fixed, uh, fixed uh, election um, uh, recommendation. We, we examined all the pros and cons of legislat legislating an election date. And quite frankly, you don't need to look too far into, uh, to our neighboring province, Prince Edward Island. What happened uh, uh, last week, they're into an election. Should have been uh, months and months away. If you look at Alberta, my understanding two days ago, they just called an election for May. They should be a year away. So 
the way we view it is if you want to legislate a fixed date election, then again, uh, uh, these are the facts. What I, what I can also tell you uh, is that uh, Robert Giz in his very last, uh, in, in his very last interview that he made as the premier in December 2014, the paper in PEI, The Guardian, has a b very big, bold uh, letter saying, my biggest mistake, fixed election dates by Robert Giz. Uh, it's something that he wanted very much in 2006. He, uh, whether campaigned on that or not, he brought it in. And uh, he determined that that was the biggest mistake Prince Edward Island did. And I'd be happy to give you that document. Uh, I'm also going to... Uh, let you know. So, so research has been done on that, and there was a uh, Chantal Hibert, uh, who is a uh, well-known uh, reporter, uh, uh, did a nice report in January 2015 on fixed date election law, no gift. And uh, her final comment on that report was, um, when all is said and done, the side effects of the remedy of of a fixed date election law are turning out to be more harmful to sound uh, policy decision making than the ills it was meant to cure. So again, uh, there's never a perfect answer. Life is never perfect. Law is not perfect. We're always looking to enhance what we have. But at this particular time, we've carefully examined uh, the pros, the cons, the whatever, and. Uh, we are not going to be uh, putting fixed election dates in this piece of legislation. Now, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And with that, I will conclude. And I move to close uh, second reading. Uh, Bill, let me see here. Uh, and, uh, I rise to, uh, I, uh, to close debate on Bill 83, amendments to the Nova Scotia Elections Act. Motion is to close debate on second reading for Bill number 83, the Elections Act. Would all those in Pardon? Motion is for second reading on Bill Number 83, the Elections Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye? aye. Contrary minded, nay. nay. Motion is carried. <laughs> Bill Number 83, entitled an act to amend Chapter 5 of the Acts of 2011, <coughs> the Elections Act. Ordered that this bill be referred to the Committee on Law Amendments. <clears throat> the Honorable Government House Leader. Speaker, that concludes the government's business for today. Uh, we shall meet tomorrow from the hours of 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, as was previously agreed to yesterday, uh, tomorrow we will start the daily routine. Uh, once the daily routine has ended, we will go to the finance critic for the official opposition to conclude his remarks on the budget and then go to the NDP caucus uh, to give their remarks on the budget. At the conclusion of that, we will go to question period. Uh, following the completion of question period, we will then move into estimates, both here in the main chamber and in the Red Room. I believe all members have been provided with a copy of which uh, departments that will be. Uh, but uh, for uh, those who may not be aware, in the main chamber, uh, the estimates of the Department of Agriculture will be up. In the Red Room, the uh, estimates of the Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage will be uh, considered. <clears throat> I can advise as well, uh, Mr. Speaker, with the passage of the uh, three bills today and uh, second reading and previous uh, bills that were passed, <clears throat> law amendments will be meeting uh, this coming Monday at noon uh, to consider all of the bills which have been referred to, uh, which have passed second reading and have been referred to law amendments. So for those watching or following our proceedings, law amendments will be meeting Monday at noon to consider all of those bills. <coughs> With that, Mr. Speaker, I would move that the House do now rise to meet again tomorrow from the hours of 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. Motion is for adjournment for the House to arise tomorrow, April 10th, Friday, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. We now stand adjourned until 9 a.m. tomorrow.